Welcome to this presentation. We will take a look at the book of Revelation, chapters 15 through 22. Now, that is quite a few chapters, so this could be a little lengthy. So, sit back, enjoy, and contemplate some of the things that are being talked about. Also, by way of note, this is the last presentation that I will do in podcast form, meaning audio format only. They charge me for putting these up on for podcasts, and I make no money off of these, and so it's getting costly. And so if you want to watch the presentation starting next year for the Book of Mormon, I suggest these are all on my YouTube channel called Coming Unto Christ by Michael S. Clough. You should be able to find it. This will be the last one that will be put on podcast format. So with that in mind, let's turn to Revelation chapter 15. Revelation 15 through 16 talk about seven plagues. Revelation 15 appears to describe what the righteous gathered in the final first harvest will experience, whereas Revelation 16 seems to describe what the wicked gathered in the second harvest will experience. Chapter 15 and 16 work together. In Revelation 15, 1, 7, John learned of seven destructive plagues that are to be poured out upon the wicked. Revelation 16 describes these seven plagues. The repeated use of the number seven may suggest the plagues represent the completion of God's judgment against the wicked in the last days. For in the seventh last plague is filled up the wrath of God. So, Revelation 15.2, a sea of glass. John saw that the righteous would stand upon a sea of glass mingled with fire. Revelation 15.2, the sea of glass represents the celestialized earth where the righteous will reside in the presence of God. See Revelations 4.6, Doctrine and Covenants 77.1, and Doctrine and Covenants 136-9. through 9. Revelation 15.2-4, victory over the beast. John saw that the righteous would gain victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, in short, over all of Satan's evils and deceptions. Revelation 15, 2 through 4 illustrate a major theme in the book of Revelation. There will be an eventual triumph on this earth of God over the devil, a permanent victory of good over evil of the saints over their persecutors, of the kingdom of God over the kingdom of men and of Satan. Such is the theme of the revelation. If we fail to catch a glimpse of the theme, we will fail in our comprehension of the book, no matter how many details we are able to understand. Revelation 15.3 talks about the Song of Moses. The Song of Moses was sung by the children of Israel following their deliverance from the Egyptian bondage. See Exodus 15, 1-18. Revelation 15, 3 tells us that the Song of Moses will be sung again by those who inherit the celestial kingdom in celebration of the Lamb of God delivering them from the bondage of sin. The lyrics to the song spoken in these verses include the words, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. These words are not found in the Song of Moses in Exodus 15, but the common element is what is important. The Lord's people were in bondage and trouble, and the Lord delivered them from their enemies. This song is also the song of the Lamb, because he is the great deliverer. (coughs) Excuse me. The song of the Lamb will ultimately be sung by all true saints. On the day of resurrection, the scriptures say, quote, The graves of the saints will be opened, and they shall come forth and stand on the right hand of the Lamb. And when he shall... 
And when he shall stand upon Mount Zion, and upon the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and they shall sing the song of the Lamb, day and night, for ever and ever. That's Doctrine and Covenants 133, 56. 15 of 5, the phrase, I looked, and the vision shifts to a new scene. The phrase, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. The ancient tabernacle of the days of Moses was called the tabernacle of witnesses, number 177, or tabernacle of testimony, because it contained the two stone tablets of the testimony on which God had written. A clear way of stating this is found in the New International Version, which quotes, I looked in and in heaven, I looked and in heaven the temple, that is, the tabernacle of testimony, was opened, unquote. The tabernacle of Moses was served as a temple until Solomon's day, when a more permanent structure was built. When John looked into the heavens again, he saw the temple in heaven open, and seven angels came out. Revelation 15.6 The seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues, meaning apparently the seven angels received their charge in the temple and then emerged with the seven plagues. The number seven indicates that the judgments are perfect and complete that the judgments come from the temple is a mark of their godly origin. The phrase clothed in purple and white linen and their breasts girded with girden, golden girdles, meaning the, the linen dresses of the angels, pure and white, indicate that they hold a sacred and holy office. Linen also suggests the bride of the Lamb, Revelation 19, 7-8, and the armies of heaven. Revelation 19.14. The rank of the angels is deducted from the golden girdles or sashes they wear, which are like that worn by Christ himself. See Revelation 1.13. 15.7. One of the four beasts. In John 4.6-9, in, in, in 4.6-9, John saw four beasts at the throne of God. In 5, 8, the beast worshipped the lamb. In 6, 1 through 3, 5 and 7, the beast invite John to see the events that occur when the seals on the book are opened. Now one of these same beasts, which are intelligent creatures, gives the angels the bowls that contain the judgments that are to be poured out on the earth. The phrase, seven golden bowls full of golden wrath of God meaning the seven bowls contain the judgment that represents God's wrath. These judgments are poured out in the following chapter. Golden bowls or vials are mentioned in 5.8, symbolizing the prayers of the saints. Perhaps the saints pleading for justice and deliverance is answered in the judgments in the seven golden bowls here. The phrase, who liveth forever and ever. This interjection reaffirms the power and dominion of God, Revelation 4, 9 and 10, 6. As one who lives forever, like the more, unlike the immortals on earth, God has full power to accomplish all his will against the wicked of the world. Revelation 15, 8, the temple was filled with smoke. The source of the smoke is the glory of God and his power. Smoke or cloud is a symbol, I'm sorry, a typical sign of the presence of God. When the Lord ascended on Mount Zion in fire, the mount was altogether on smoke, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole multitude quaked greatly. Exodus 19.18 No man was able to enter into the temple, meaning because God is present in the heavenly temple, Filling it with his glory, no one is able to go in until the seven plagues are complete. This expression evidently indicates that God continues to actively exercise his power and judgment until the wicked are destroyed. No one can approach him pleading mercy. We read in the Old Testament 
of another circumstance in which God's power prevailed among, pre prevented man from entering his temple. Quote, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord was filled, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That's Exodus 40, verses 34 through 35. Let's now turn to chapter 16 in the book of Revelation. The day of God's judgment is a day of wrath. The day is fast approaching. Vengeance cometh speedily, the Lord says. As a whirlwind, it shall come upon all the face of the world. It's from Doctrine and Covenants 112, 24. The righteous will be blessed with a degree of protection. Quote, Zion shall escape if she observed to do all things whatsoever I command her. Doctrine and Covenants 97, 5, 25. But those among the saints who are hypocrites have no such promise. Indeed, they will be the first to be judged. Quote, Upon my house it, the day of vengeance, begin. And from my house it shall go forth, saith the Lord. First among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name, and have not known me, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. Unquote. Doctrine and Covenants 112, 25 through 26. This chapter of Revelation details the scourges and plagues that will afflict mankind in the final in the day of the final judgments, plagues that will smite the land, the sea, the rivers, the sun, and the kingdom of spiritual darkness. Through the power of God, the very foundation of the earth are shaken, and Babylon is prepared to be totally destroyed. These plagues may well fit the description the Lord gave us elsewhere in moderate, modern revelation. Quote, For behold and lo, vengeance cometh speedily upon the ungodly as the whirlwind, and who shall escape it? The Lord's scourge shall pass over by night and by, and by day, and the report thereof shall vex all people. Yea, it shall not be stayed until the Lord come, for the the indignation of the Lord is kindled against their abominations and all their wicked works. Doctrine and Covenants 97.22-24 And again, their testimony, the elders, shall also go forth unto the condemnation of this generation, if they harden their hearts against them. For a desolating scourge shall go forth among the inhabitants of the earth, and shall continue to be poured out from time to time, if they repent not until the earth is empty, and the inhabitants thereof are consumed away and utterly destroyed by the brightness of his coming. That's Doctrine Covenants five eighteen through 19. Some commentators believe that the judgments in this chapter are a repetition of the plagues in Revelation 8, 9, and 11. That is one possible reading. There are remarkable parallels between the two sections, but it seems more likely that Revelation 16 represents a later and more severe occurrence of plagues. In Revelation 8, for instance, a third of the sea becomes blood and a third of the creatures in the sea die. But in Revelation 16, all of the sea becomes blood and all creatures die therein. 16.3 a comparison of the plagues in both sections show a similar progression. As God continues to plead with and to punish the earth through his judgments, those judgments become more severe. The following information about the seven angels and the associated plagues is taken from John W. Perry and J. A. Perry, book called Understanding the Book of Revelation from pages 203 to 215. Revelation 16.1 The vials of the wrath of God are poured, are poured out in Revelation 16. John describes the scourges and plagues that will be poured out in the final days prior to the second coming of Christ. See also Revelation 15.1.7 16.1, I heard a great voice out of the temple. 
In 1558, we learn that no one could enter the temple until the next seven plagues were completed. This voice might be the voice of God himself commanding the seven angels to act. The phrase, go your ways, the voice tell the angels to move ahead with their commission to administer the plagues to the earth. The phrase, pour out the bowls of the wrath of God, meaning, under the law of Moses, the priest used a sacred bowl to capture the blood of the sacrifice. As part of the ritual, the priest then sprinkled the blood around the altar, Leviticus 1, 5 and 3, 8. Perhaps in this part of the vision, John is seeing a reversal of this ritual. Rather than blood coming from the bowl to save the people, John sees something coming from the bowls that sheds blood and punishes the people. That which is poured from the bowls represents different manifestations of God's wrath. 16.2, the phrase, the first poured out his bowl upon the earth, and there fell a noise, noisome and grievous sore. Meaning the first plague, which is directed at the wicked, is of disgusting and ver, 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 virulent sores. This plague parallels the six plagues that fell on the Egyptians in the times of Moses. The contents of this bowl are poured out on the earth itself, and affliction falls on those who dwell on the earth. The wicked have earlier worn the mark of the beast, now they wear the mark of the wrath of God. Zechariah prophesies a plague that may be similar, quote, This shall be the plague wherein the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in the holes, and in their tongue shall consume away in their mouths. That's Zechariah 14.21. And we read in latter day revelation, quote, their tongue shall be stayed, that they shall not utter against me, and their flesh shall from fall off from their bones, and their eyes from their eye sockets. Doctrine and Covenants 29.19 These descriptions sound very much like some of the effects of nuclear war. See the horrific results of atomic warfare can be read in the book by Hershey Hiroshima. For a description of the effects of the skin and the eyes, See pages 59 and 67 of that book. In Doctrine Covenant, or I'm sorry, Revelation 16.3, the second angel poured out his bowl upon the sea, and it became as blood. Every living soul died in the sea. This plague and that which follows parallels the first plague the Lord brought upon ancient Israel. The waters turned to blood. In Revelation 8, 8 through 9, a third of the waters were afflicted. Here, the polluted water kills every creature. This may have connection with words of the Lord given in our dispensation. Quote, Behold, there are many dangers upon the waters, and more especially hereafter. For I, the Lord, have decreed in mine anger against many destructions upon the waters. Unquote. Doctrine and Covenants 61, 4 through 5. We can only speculate on the cause of this destruction. It may be related to the fallout from nuclear war. There may be another meaning to the sea in this passage. In Revelation 17:15, the water represents people and multitudes and nations and tongues. Perhaps here as well as the sea represents the wicked people of the world, all of whom are eventually destroyed as <clears throat> the phrase as the blood of a dead man, meaning a person's blood gives life to the body as water gives life to the world and the creatures thereof. But a dead man's blood is corrupted and co coagulated, no longer able to help sustain life. So shall it be with the waters of the sea as a result of this plague. Revelation 16.4 The third angel poured out his bowl upon the rivers. They became blood. This plague, like that of 16.3, parallels the one found in Exodus 7.19-21. In Revelation 8.10-11, a burning star turned a third of the rivers and fountains of water bitter. Here, all the rivers and fountains are polluted, becoming blood. 
Revelation 15, uh, 16, 5, the angel of the waters. Anciently, the Jews believed that different angels had charge of different elements of nature. The vision of John seems to support this belief. In, John 7, in Revelation 17, 1, we see four angels who had power over the four winds of the earth. In Revelation 14, 8, we read of an angel who had power over fire. Here we have one more angel who seems to have power over the fate of the waters. Or if we read this verse more simply, we might understand that it refers only to the angel who, in 16.4, poured his bowl out upon the rivers. The phrase, Thou art righteous, O Lord, because thou hast judged thus, meaning, even though the judgments are on the earth are terrible, the angel proclaims that the Lord is righteous and correct, to have so judged. Why? The answer is given in the next verse. Not only have the people chosen lives of sin, but they have slain those who desire to follow the Lord. For such great sin, the Lord righteously punishes them with everlasting judgments. Chapter 16, verse 6. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, given them blood to drink. The motif of blood continues as we are reminded that the wicked have slain many of the righteous and learn that in punishment that fits the crime, the wicked will themselves be forced to drink blood. Isaiah 49, 26. Quote, to be drunk with blood signifies slaughter of the sword. The King James Version says the wicked are worthy of this punishment. A more accurate translation may be deserving. The scriptures record many general statements documenting the rejection and killing of the Lord's prophets. You can see 1 Thessalonians 2.15, Hebrews 11.37, Revelation 6.9, 12.11, 16.6, Helaman 13.34, and 3 Nephi 10.15. The mortal Jesus prophesied that martyrdom was precisely what many of the followers would suffer. Matthew 23, verses 29 through 38, and chapter 24, 9. Revelation 16, 7. I heard another angel who came out from the altar. Almost without exception, the altar in Revelation is connected with the judgments of God. The angel declares that God's judgments are indeed true and righteous, as is the case with all his works. 16.8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and scorched men with fire. The righteous are promised in 17.16 that neither shall the sunlight on them Neither shall the sunlight on them nor any heat, meaning that they will not suffer from the heat of the sun. But here the wicked suffer from intense heat, perhaps from the sun. This may result from a breakdown of the ozone layer of the atmosphere, which could result from a nuclear blast, and which could remove such of our protection from the sun's potential deadly rays, or it may have a cause that we cannot yet imagine. For a discussion on the effects of nuclear war on the ozone layer, see Jonathan Shell's book, Fate of the Earth, pages 20 through 21 and 79 through 92. The scriptures often connect fire with judgment. This fire prefigures the scorching fire of the last judgment, Malachi 4.1. The fourth angel acts under the direction of God and by the power that was given unto him. Revelation 16, 9. Men were scourged with great heat, blasphemed the name of God, repented not to give him glory. Meaning the heat of this plague is here described as great, and the idea of scorching is repeated perhaps for emphasis. But rather than acknowledge their guilt, the wicked appear to blame God for their troubles, speaking evil of him and of his righteousness. Blasphemy is a reoccurring accusation against the wicked. In Revelation 2, 9 and 16, 11, 21, even at this late hour in the world's history, men have an opportunity to repent, but still they refuse. An angel in 14.7 admonishes the world to fear God and give glory to him. 
but the great body of people on earth choose their sin instead. Revelation 16.10, the fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the seat of the beast. His kingdom was full of darkness, meaning in the ninth plague that Moses proclaimed in Egypt, the whole kingdom was stricken with thick darkness, Exodus 10.21-23. Here darkness fills the kingdom of the beast, Isaiah 60, verse 2, DNC 82, 5, 84, 49, and 112, 23. The darkness may be literal or spiritual or both, most likely because the darkness results from an action of an angel of God who would not be the source of spiritual darkness. It is probably a literal darkness that reflects the spiritual darkness in the beast's kingdom. The sea of the beast may more accurately be translated the throne of the beast. The seat of the beast, I'm sorry, not sea, more accurately translated as the throne of the beast. The idea is that the Lord will attack the beast at his very headquarters, striking at his power and authority. This plague may be fulfillment of a curse that the Lord pronounced upon the wicked in the times of Moses. Quote, the Lord shall smite thee with madness and with blindness and astonishment of he heart, and thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind grope within darkness, and thou shalt not pos prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. No man shall save thee. That's Deuteronomy 28. 28-29. Revelation 16, 10-11, they nod their tongues for pain, blasphemed the God of heaven, and repented not of their deeds. The terrible pain that men suffer may be a result of the sores in Revelation 16, 2, combined with the lack of clean water in 16, 4, and the scorching, scorching heat of the sun in 16, 9. The darkness into which they are plunged can only exasperate their plight. Again, the fall, again they follow their leader, the beast, and blaspheming God. Revelation 13, 1 and 5, verse 5 through 6 and 17, verse 3. Blaming him for their pains and sores, and still they will not repent. It seems incredible that people would not turn to God with humble spirits after suffering so much, but they followed the pattern of a scriptural type of long ago. Despite all that he and his people suffered, the Egyptian pharaoh in the time of Moses only hardened his heart. In Revelation 16:12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river Euphrates, the water thereof was dried up. In the days of Moses and Joshua, the Lord divided and dried up a passage through its two bodies of water to enable his people to deliver from bondage and then to inherit the promised land. But in John's vision, the Lord through his angels will dry up the water of a river to clear the way for destruction and war. The Euphrates formed the eastern and northeastern boundary of the land the Lord gave to Abraham and his descendants and served as a natural barrier to the enemies of Israel. When that barrier is removed, the enemies of Israel can begin their march. The Old Testament speaks often of the Lord drying up waters to accomplish his purposes. Exodus 14:21, Joshua 3:13-7, Isaiah 11:15-16, Isaiah 44:27, Jeremiah 51:36 and Zechariah 10:11. The phrase that the way of the king of the east might be prepared meaning it is uncertain who the kings of the east are. One commentator noted that there have been more than 50 different interpretations of this expression. What most agree on is that the kings are enemies of the Lord's people and the Lord himself, and that they are prepared to go forth to war. Revelation 16, 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, false prophets. The satanic trinity 
of the dragon, the beast, and false prophets send forth evil spirits or devils to do their work. Their emergence from the mouth of the devil and his helper suggests that these evil spirits are symbolic of false communications, lies, and propaganda designed to deceive the people of the world. Similarly, in Revelation 12:15, a river that may represent lies comes from the mouth of the dragon. In Revelation 13:5, blasphemies come from the mouth of the beast. And in Revelation 13 through 14, the false prophet or second beast seems to speak threats and ungodly commands. Frogs, to which the spirits are compared, are unclean animals under the law of Moses, Leviticus 11.10. One of the plagues that Aaron, Moses and Aaron brought against Egypt was a plague of frogs. Interestingly, Pharaoh's magicians, using Satan's power, duplicated this plague. In nearby Persia, which was east of the Euphrates, frogs were considered to be the instrument of Hiraman, the, dark, the god of darkness. Further, Hiraman had power to change his shape, and the animal form that fits him most naturally was that of a frog. A fact that three unclean spirits come forth from three different evil beings suggests that each of these beings, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophets, may send forth one of the spirits. These evil spirits are the agents and representatives of those who send them forth. As righteous men on earth can stand for God by virtue of the priesthood they hold, so can these unclean spirits stand for Satan through the evil power he bestows upon them. Revelation 16, 14 For they are the spirits of the devil. Here we learn definitively who the three unclean spirits of 1613 are spirits of devils. Devil of, devils, of course, are not body and spirit combined, but only spirits. Perhaps a better translation would be spirits that are devils. The Lord has told us, quote, Hearken, O ye elders of my church, and give ear to the voice of the living God. Attend to the words of wisdom which shall be given unto you, according as ye have asked and are agreed as touching the church and the spirits which has gone abroad in the earth. Behold, verily I say unto you, that there are many spirits which are false spirits, which have gone forth in the earth, deceiving the world. And also Satan has sought to deceive you, that he might overthrow you. End of quote. That was Doctrine and Covenants 50, 1 through 3. The phrase, working miracles, meaning Jesus Christ prophesied, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall... And sh and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. These evil spirits are part of the fulfillment of that prophecy. The miracles of Satan and the miracles of God may often be indistinguishable one from another to the outward senses. Only through the discernment given by the Spirit of God can we know the difference. No wonder President Nelson is urges to seek the Spirit if we are going to survive the last days. Elder Orson Pratt wrote, quote, The reason the Lord will suffer the devil to work miracles to deceive the kings of the earth and of the whole world is because they will previously have rejected the everlasting gospel. Therefore, the devil will deceive them and lead them on to destruction as he did the Egyptians. End of quote. Go forth unto the kings of the whole world, that phrase meaning, the deceiving spirit sent forth by Satan will have worldwide influence, including with the rulers of the nations of the earth. The spirits will cause the gathering of the kings and their armies together to battle. The phrase to gather them to battle, meaning this battle is the great final battle at Armageddon, which will be fought by the armies of the earth. That battle, perhaps, when it reaches its crisis point, will be interrupted by the coming of the Lord. See Zechariah 14, 1-4. The great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, 15. Blesses he that watcheth. 
We have often been commanded to be alert and watch the signs of the times as the day of Christ's return the, as the the day of Christ's return draws close. Watching also implies being obedient and prepared. Specifically, Latter-day Revelation tells us we need to be prepared by having the Holy Spirit as our guide. Doctrine and Covenants 45, 56-57 The phrase, keep his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame, meaning to keep one's garment is to be ready for any eventuality, specifically here the coming of the Lord. If a soldier does not know when the battle will begin, he needs to keep the proper clothing or armor at hand for any eventuality. If he does not, he may be caught unawares and have to go forth naked. The phrase, but there is a deeper meaning, suggested by a similar statement in Revelation 3, 3-5. through there we read the warning that the Lord will come as a thief and the promise that those who have not defiled their garments shall walk with me in white. To keep one's garments in this sense is to keep them pure, to avoid and resist sin. It is to keep the covenants and promises one made in the temple. As Alma said, quote, And may the Lord bless you and keep your garments spotless, that you may be at last be brought to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the holy prophets who have been ever since the world began, having your garments spotless, even as their garments are spotless, in the kingdom of heaven, to go no more out. Alma 7.25 This verse is an interjection, a parenthetical warning, and word of comfort to the saints. The terrors of the last days will continue and worsen, those who yield themselves to sin will be exposed, but those who remain prepared and pure will be blessed. In the spiritual sense, keeping one's garment symbolizes the spiritual readiness that results from living in spiritual watchfulness and receiving the blessings of the temple. Many other scriptures exhort people to live with watchfulness. Matthew twenty four forty two through 25 Matthew 26, 41, DNC 45, 44, DNC 133, 10 through 11. Furthermore, Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught that keeping one's garments also represents spiritual safety. To defile one's garments of the holy priesthood is to disobey the Lord's law, and to keep one's garments. Revelation 16.15 is to keep the commandments and qualify for the robes of righteousness that clothe celestial beings. End of quote. Revelation 16.16, 16, he gathered them together, Armageddon. Armageddon is the site of the last great battle before the coming of the Lord. The person gathering the armies together is not identified, but is likely Satan working through the evil spirits he sends to the earth. Armageddon is the New Testament name for Megiddo, an ancient city some 60 miles north of Jerusalem. Megiddo lay on the north side of the Carmel Ridge and commanded the strategic pass between the coastal plain and the valley of Estralian. The area is one of history's most famous battlefields, having witnessed major conflicts all the way from one fought by Tutmosis III in 1468 B.C. to that of the Lord Allenby of Megiddo in 1917. But the waters of Megiddo, Barak and Deborah defeated the chariots of Caesarea. In that same area, Gideon and his 300 soldiers defeated the Midianites, and Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle, as was King Josiah. The king of the whole world will be destroyed in final conflict outside the city of Jerusalem. Armageddon is symbolic of the final overthrow of all the forces of evil by the might and power of God. The great battle of Armageddon will not be a localized conflict, but the center of a worldwide war. Elder Bruce R. McConkley explained, quote, the center of the battle will be on the mount and in the valley of Megiddo and on the plains of Estralion. Though 
since all nations are involved, it cannot be other than a worldwide conflict. End of quote. The Battle of Armageddon was seen and prophesied anciently by Joel and Zechariah. See Joel 3, 19-14 and Zechariah 14, 2-5. Ultimately, the object of Satan and his armies is not the conquest of northern Israel nor of Jerusalem, but the destruction of the Lord's temple and the Lord's work. Six, chapter 16, verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. Other angels poured their bowls out upon the earth, the sea, the river, the sun, the sea of the beast, and the Euphrates. By pouring his bowl out into air, the angel seems to be affecting all of earth through its all-encompassing atmosphere. The sounding of the last trumpet and the pouring forth of the last bowl are quite similar in their results, both signifying the end of Earth's history. Here is just a little outline of the trumpets being sounded in the bowls and their similarities. To trumpet, the Lord's kingdom is established. The bowl, God's purpose, is accomplished. The trumpet, the time of Lord's judgment, is announced. The bowl, judgment falls on the earth. The trumpet, the temple of heaven, is open. The bowl, a great voice, comes forth from the temple in heaven. The trumpets, there are lightnings, voices, thunderings, and a great earthquake and a hailstorm. The bowls, there are voices, thunderings, lightnings, and a great earthquake and hail. Though there are parallels between events following the sounding of the trump and the pouring forth of God's wrath from the bowl, these two events may well be different occurring at different times. The first series seems to prefigure the second. The phrase great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying it is done, meaning because this voice comes from the throne in the temple of heaven, it must belong to God the Father who is seated on the throne and rules over all. By saying it is done, he announces that all things have been accomplished and a time has come for the final destruction of Babylon and of the earth. Revelation 16, 18. There were voices, thunderings, and lightnings. The thunderings and lightnings may indicate that all nature is in uproar as a result of the judgments poured forth from the last bowl. The voices may be God's proclamations of judgment and command as we see in Doctrine and Covenants, where he prepares the earth to return to its paradisiacal glory. Quote, and he shall utter his voice out of Zion, and he shall speak from Jerusalem, and his voice shall be heard among all people, and it shall be the voice of the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, which shall break down the mountains, and the valleys shall not be found. He shall command the great deep, and it shall be driven back into the north countries. And the islands shall become one land, and the land of Jerusalem, the land of Zion, shall be turned back into their own place. And the earth shall be like as it was in the days before it was divided. And the Lord, even the Savior, shall stand in the midst of his people, and shall reign over all his flesh. End of quote. That's Doctrine and Covenants 133, verses 21 through 25. The phrase, there was a great earthquake. This great earthquake is different from the ones mentioned in 6.12 and 11.13-14. The earthquake in 6.12 was so great that the mountains and the islands were moved out of their place, 6.14. But that earthquake occurred in the period of the 6,000 years. See Doctrine and Covenants 77, 6 through 7 The earthquake in 11 verses 13 through 14 was the first in the 7,000 year period. It is of indeterminate size and intensity. The earthquake in 1618 is described as the greatest in the history of the world. It is so great, as we read in 1620, that it appears to be connected with the flattening of the mountains and the unifying of the continents.
One of the plainest and most oft-repeated statements about the ushering in of the millennium is the promise of a great shaking of the earth, of earthquakes that are everywhere at one and the same time, of mountains and valleys and seas and landmasses that move. Yet once it is a little while, saith the Lord, I will shake the heavens and earth, and the sea and the dry land, and I shall say, shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. It's Haggai 2, 6-7. Christ, the desire of all nations, shall come amidst the great shaking of the earth, and of all things that has ever been or ever will be in the entire history of this planet. Everything on earth, historical events then in progress, the beasts and all forms of life and inanimate objects that do not act for themselves, everything on earth will be affected by the great shaking. Revelation sixteen nineteen: the great city was divided into three parts. The great city seems to be Babylon, which at the end times is not a literal city, but a figure of city representative of all wicked societies on the earth. The division into three parts suggests that the city is fully weakened and prepared for the final destructive blow. The phrase, the city of the nations fell. The cities of the nations fell in the earthquake, but this passage also seems to refer to the destruction of governments. The events in these verses bring about the ultimate, f brings about the fulfillment of the latter-day prophecy made by Joseph Smith, quote, With the sword and by bloodshed the inhabitants of the earth shall mourn, and with famine and plagues and earthquakes and the thunder of heaven. And the fierce and vivid lightning also shall the inhabitants of the earth be made to feel the wrath and indignation and chastening hand of Almighty God, until the consumption decree hath been made a full end of all nations. Doctrine and Covenants 87, 6. Revelation 16, 20. Every island fled away. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained the physical changes that will take place when the earth is returned to its original state. Quote, we are informed that the Lord shall command the great deep, and it shall be driven back into the north country, and the islands shall become one land, and the land of Jerusalem and the land of Zion shall be turned back into their own place, and the earth shall be like as it was in the days before it was divided. The notion prevails quite generally that the dividing of the earth in the days of Peleg was a division politically among the people. But from, his, from this word of the Lord, we gain the idea the earth itself was divided and that when Christ comes, it will again be brought back to the same condition physically as prevailed before this division took place. The sea is to be driven back into the north. The land is to be brought back as it was originally, and the lands of Zion, America, and Jerusalem, Palestine, and all the lands pertaining to it, will be restored to their own place as they were in the beginning. The Savior will stand in the midst of his people, and shall reign over all flesh. We have discovered in our study that the wicked, or all things that are corruptible, will be consumed, and thereof will be, not be permitted to be on earth, when this time comes. End of quote. Revelation 16, 21, There fell among men a great hell out of heaven. Deadly hailstones are one of the elements of nature, of nature God periodically uses to assist the righteous in their battles and to punish the wicked. See Joshua 10, 11 and Mosiah 12, 6. The hailstorms are often prophesied among the troubles to come. A very grievous hell was one of the plagues sent upon Egypt in the days of Moses. The phrase every stone weighed about uh, every stone about the weight of a talent. Each of these hellstone weighs between forty five and ninety pounds. The exact weight of a talent is uncertain. The point is that these hellstones are tremendous in size and catastrophic in their effect. The phrase, men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell. Not only do the people who are filled repent, but they speak evil of God, for that which he does in perfect justice. Let's now go to Revelation chapter 17. 
Revelation 17 through 18, the fall of Babylon. This chapter, along with 18, is a teaching interlude that shows John and us why the judgments in chapter 16 are righteous and just. We see in symbolic form the depths of the evil world, and we understand why God's wrath is so strong against it. We also see the source of Babylon's destruction, not God, but Babylon's own wicked lovers. As chapter 17 begins, John is invited to see the judgments of the whore, but first he sees her arrayed in, in her power. The angel bears witness that the whore has power over all the earth, many waters, and that she has influence over kings and the people of the world. Through the power of the Spirit, John actually sees the whore, though he has seen a symbol surrounded by other symbolic layers of meaning. He sees her excesses in her lusts for wealth and pleasure, and shown by her clothing and jewelry. He sees her pride as shown by the name on her forehead. He sees her wickedness by the name and by the murder of the righteous. Centuries earlier, Nephi saw a similar vision. Many generations after the time of peace that followed the coming of Christ to the Americas, Nephi saw the whore of all the earth. This part of this vision clearly concerns the time of the great apostasy and the last days. What he saw helps us understand what John saw and recorded particularly chapters 13, 17, and 18 of John's Revelation. As 1 Nephi 13 opens, Nephi sees the nations and the kingdoms of the Gentiles. Verse 3, among, in chapter 13 of 1 Nephi, among these nations, he sees the formation of a church which is most abominable above all other churches, which slays the saints of God, yea, and tortureth them, and bindeth them down, and yoketh them with a yoke of iron, and bringeth them down into captivity. That's verse 5. The founder of this great and abominable church is the devil himself. Verse 6. And I also saw gold and silver, silk and scarlet, and fine tine lint, fine twined linen and all manner of precious clothing and I saw many harlots which the scripture explains are the desires of this great and abominable church verses 7 through 8 next Nephi sees Columbus discover America verse 12 followed by the Revolutionary War verses 17 through 19 which further helps to place the prophecies in the time of the great apostasy Nephi learns that the great and abominable church, which is most abominable above all churches, was formed after the Bible went forth from the Jews unto the Gentiles. Verse 26. Further, he sees that the great and abominable church takes away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious, and also many covenants of the Lord. Verse 26. Their motive is malicious. And all this they have done, that they might pervert the way, right ways of the Lord, that they might blind the eyes and harden the hearts of the children of men. Verse 27. Because of these things which are taken out of the gospel of the Lamb, an exceedingly great many do stumble, yea, insomuch that Satan hath great power over them. Verse 29. In the verses that follow Nephi, in the verses that follow, Nephi learns that the abominable church is the mother of harlots, verse 34, that the church had dug a great pit for the destruction of men, first Nephi 14.3, and that the great and abominable church is the mother of abominations, verse 9. Nephi learned that there are finally only two churches on earth. The one is the church of the Lamb of God, the other is the church of the devil. Wherefore, whosoever belongeth not to the church of the Lamb belongeth to the great church, which is the mother of abominations, and she is the whore of all the earth. Verse 10. The whore of all the earth sat upon many waters, and she had dominion over all the earth, among all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. Verse 11. Because of that dominion, and because of the wickedness and abominations of the whore, the numbers of the church of the Lamb of God were few. Verse 12. And it came to pass, Nephi wrote, that I beheld that the great mother of abominations did gather together multitudes upon the face of the earth among all nations of the Gentiles to fight against the Lamb of God. 
And it came to pass that I beheld that the wrath of God was poured out upon the great and abominable church, insomuch that there were wars and rumors of wars among all the nations and kindreds of the earth. And when the day cometh that the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of harlots, which is the great and abominable church, and of all the earth whose founder is the devil, then at that day the Lord the work of the Father shall commence in preparing the way of the fulfilling of his covenants, which he has made to his people who are of the house of Israel. So those verses 13, 15, and 17. This great and abominable church is the church of the devil. It is the mother of abominations. It is the whore of all the earth. It is Babylon, the prostituted government of the world. That's why it's found throughout all the world, because governments will be found throughout all nations, but they will be prostituted, wicked governments. Elder Bruce R. McConkie gave a powerful description of that church, quote, What is the church of the devil in our day, and where is the seat of her power? If we accept the angelic word, if we believe as Nephi believed, and if the Lord willing we see that Nephi saw, then we shall accept without question the reality around us. The church of the devil is every evil and worldly organization on earth. It is all of the systems, both Christian and non-Christian, that have perverted the pure and perfect gospel in all of the governments and powers that run counter to the divine will. It is the societies and political parties and labor unions that sow that strife and reap contention. It is communism, it is Islam, it is Buddhism, it is modern Christianity in all its part. It is German under Hitler, Russia under Stalin, and Italy under Mussolini. It is the man of sin seeking, speaking in churches, orating in legislative halls, and commanding the armies of men. It is headquarters, it and its headquarters are everywhere, in Rome, in Moscow, in Paris, in London, in Tehran, in Washington. Everywhere that evil forces, either of church or state or society, can be influenced. The eminent and all-prevailing presence of evil in high places is one of the signs of the times. End of quote. Chapter 17, verse 1. One of the seven angels. One of the angels with one of the bulls of the wrath of God approaches John and invites him to see the judgment of the great whore. The phrase, talked with me, John is not merely observing things in his vision, for the angel is interacting with him, apparently speaking with him as one man does with another. The angel offers to show John the whore, the representation, the foundation of evil in the world. In 21.9, an angel, possibly the same one, takes John to see the bride of the lamb. In both cases, John sees the woman as a city, the first as the wicked city of Babylon, the second as the holy city city of New Jerusalem. The phrase, the judgment of the great whore, meaning the image of prostitution was commonly used in the Old Testament to depict extreme apostasy, not only from religion, but from all that is godly and good. Nephi gives us a definition of who the great whore is. Quote, he that fighteth against Zion, both Jew and Gentile, both bond and free, both male and female, shall perish. For they are they who are the whore of all the earth. For they who are not of men are against me, saith our God. 2 Nephi 10, 16. The judgments of the great whore means simply the punishment of the world of wickedness. The judgment is described in detail in Revelation 17 and 18. Nephi also saw the great judgment, quote, The blood of that great and abominable church, which is the whore of all the earth, shall turn upon their own heads, for they shall war among themselves, and the sword of their own hands shall fall upon their own heads, and they shall be drunken with their own blood. And every nation which shall war against thee, O house of Israel, shall be turned against one another. And they shall fall into the pit which they dig to ensnare the people of the Lord. And all that fight against Zion shall be destroyed. And that great whore who hath perverted the right ways of the Lord, yea, that great and abominable church shall tumble to the dust, and great shall be the fall of it. For behold, saith the prophet, the time speedily 
cometh speedily, that Satan shall have no more power over the hearts of the children of men. For the day soon cometh that all the proud, and they who do wickedly, shall be as stubble, and the day cometh that they must be burned. For the time soon cometh that the fullness of the wrath of God shall be poured out upon the children of men, for he will not suffer the wicked, he will not suffer that the wicked shall destroy the righteous. Behold, my brethren, I say unto you, these things must shortly come. Yea, even blood and fire and vapor of smoke must come, and it must needs be upon the face of this earth. And it cometh unto men according to the flesh, if it so be that they will harden their hearts against the Holy One of Israel. End of quote. That was First Nephi, chapter 22, verses 13 through 16 and 18. And see DNC 8894. The phrase sitting upon many waters, meaning the interpretation of the expression many waters, is given in 1715. The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth, sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. As Nephi saw, the whole earth had dominion over all the earth among all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. 1 Nephi 14.11 Chapter 17, verse 12, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, meaning the rulers of the earth who ought to lead in righteousness instead lead the people into sin. They commit fornication with the whore by selling that which is good and right and true, even their very souls for the pleasure and power the whore will give them. They commit fornication by turning from their true head, or at least him, to whom they are betrothed, God himself, to Babylon. To a greater or lesser degree, as the case may be, all of the governments of the earth are in league with the great whore in that, from time to time, they do such things as prohibit the worship of God, enact laws defining religious beliefs and prescribing forms of worship, maintain state-supported false systems of religion, deny freedom of religious belief to all their citizens, impose the religious beliefs of conquerors upon conquered people, permit the mingling of religious influence with civil government, foster one's religious society and prescribe another, deny to men their inherent and inalienable rights, fail to guarantee the free exercise of conscience, the right and control of property, and the protection of life, enact laws which curtail the agency of man, require the teaching of false principles in their educational systems, deny the representatives of certain churches the right to teach their doctrines or proselyte among their people, and to fail to punish crime and protect the righteous of their citizens, particularly unpopular minority groups. Haven't seen a lot of this already happening and beginning to happen and still happening and it will continue to happen. Chapter 17, verse 2, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Meaning drunkenness here is a symbol of apostasy in which the people lose the power of good judgment because of their unwise choices. They are drunken but not with wine, Isaiah prophesied. They stagger but not with strong drink, Isaiah 29.9. The wine that makes them drunk is not the fornication of sexuality but that of unfaithfulness to God. 17.3 So he carried me away in the spirit. Nephi, son of Lehi, received the same blessing when he experienced his vision of the last days, as did Jesus in the day of his temptation. It appears that in these instances, the Spirit or the Holy Ghost may carry a person to another location while at the same time enabling him to transcend his physical limit limitations to rend the veil. Others in scriptures who received this blessing include Adam, Ezekiel, Mary, the mother of Jesus, the phrase into the wilderness, meaning in Revelation 12, we saw the woman who represented the church of God, the bride of Christ, go into the wilderness for safety. Now we see her counterfeit, the woman who represents the church of the devil dwelling in the wilderness. In the first instance, the wilderness symbolizes a place of refuge. Here, it symbolizes the dryness and desolation of sin. 
the phrase I saw a woman sit upon scarlet colored beast. The beast is most likely the same as found in 13.1. Both have seven heads and ten horns. The woman is the whore spoken of in 17.1. The scarlet color of the beast is the same color as the ribbon that was tied around the neck of the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. The, ri the ribbon represented the sins of Israel. In the same way, the scarlet of the beast seems to represent sin. The phrase, full of names of blasphemy meaning this phrase repeats the description of the beast in 13.1. But in the earlier reference, the beast had the name of blasphemy on his seven heads. Here the beast is full of those names, having seven heads and ten horns, meaning, as we learn in 17.9-10, the seven heads represent seven mountains and seven kings. The ten horns represent ten kings that are yet to come. These numbers may well be symbolic rather than literal, seven being symbolic of completeness and ten being symbolic of totality, with horns symbolic of power. Thus, the woman is in complete control of the governments of the world, along with the woman having total power of her rule. So one day we will probably see a worldwide type of governments that is in complete control under the power of Satan. Chapter 17, verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and sc scarlet color. Purple coloring symbolized royalty, and scarlet indicates her position of wealth and power in the world. But there is a deeper significance. In the Old Testament, purple and scarlet appear together only in Exodus, occurring 26 times. And in every instance, the colors are used together with blue and white linen to describe the tabernacle of the Lord and the clothing of the high priest. Purple and scarlet were used in the curtains of the tabernacle, the hanging of the door, the hanging for the gates of the court, and the veil itself. They were used for the ephod, linen apron of the high priest, as well as for his girdle, the hem of his robe, the breastplate, and the clothes used in the temple rituals. Thus, the woman is standing as counterfeit for the most sacred elements of true religion, the high priest who presided over all the people in the temple. She is trying to supplant the religion of God with a false religion, one that points the people to sin and excess and ultimately to a worship of Satan himself. You see this today, the counterfeit of Satan's ideologies and philosophies being taught today to be the true religion of the world, but really they are the false religions, philosophies, and ideas of Satan. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, critical race theory, all of these are false philosophies of Satan. A woman who is Babylon is not only wickedness, but also political power, and, mo and moreover, not only political power, but religious systems that entice all men to turn their hearts to Satan. She seems to combine elements of the first and second beast and the false prophet. Even with all her worldly trappings, the glory of this woman pales when compared to the woman clothed with the sun in chapter 12, verse 1 and the simple beauty of the bride of the Lamb in 19.7-8. The phrase deck with gold and precious stones and pearls, meaning these are symbols of wealth. The word deck indicates that the woman wears an excessive amount of this jewelry. In fact, everything about the woman speaks of pride, worldliness, and excess. As Nephi explained in 1 Nephi 13.7-8, quote, and I also saw gold and silver and silks and scarlets and fine twined linen and all manner of precious clothing. And I saw many harlots, Nephi said. And the angel spake unto me, saying, Behold the gold, the silver, and the silks, and the scarlets, and the fine twined linen and precious clothing and harlots are the desires of this great and abominable church. Revelation 17.4, having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination, filthiness of her fornication. A golden cup indicates wealth, and one seeing such a cup would expect to find it something pleasurable to drink. Instead, the woman's cup is filled with abominations and filthiness, which stems from the woman's fornication and turning her heart from God to Satan. 
abomination or offenses against God that are particularly vile and disgusting. 17, verse 3 and 7, and verses 7 through 18, these passages deal with the beast upon which the woman sat, and the relationship of various kingdoms to the event seen is a perfect illustration of what the prophet Joseph Smith had in mind when he said, quote, Whenever God gives a vision or an image or beast or figure of any kind, he always holds himself responsible to give a revelation or interpretation of the meaning thereof. Otherwise, we are not responsible or accountable for our belief in it. Don't be afraid of being damned for not knowing the meaning of a vision or figure if God has not given a revelation or interpretation of the subject. End of quote. Until such time as for the revelation is received, it is fruitless to speculate on the details meaning of these, these things. Brief commentary will be made only of those portions which are inspired interpretations which have been made or where the meaning is clear because of other revealed truths. 17.5 And upon her forehead it was a name written. The book of Revelation mentions a mark on the forehead seven times. We read in 13.6, 14.9, and 24 of the mark of the beast on the forehead or in the hands of those who follow him. In 17.3, 9.4, 14.1, and 22.4, we read of the righteous receiving the name or seal of God on their foreheads. But here the woman has her own name written on her forehead. Some authorities believe it was common in ancient Rome for prostitutes to write their names on their foreheads, probably on a headband. Chapter 17, verse 5, the word mystery. The righteous know the hidden things of God called the mysteries. The great mysteries are reserved for those who receive such keys to such ministries in the temple, who keep their temple covenants, who hunger and thirst after the things of godliness. The woman here is the embodiment of the mysteries of Satan, the counterfeit of the mysteries of God. These mysteries are found in false religious creed and in the secret works of darkness and in secret combinations which is most abominable and wicked above all in the sight of God. The phrase Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great is the church of the devil. It is the world with all its evil and carnality. It is every organization of every kind, sort, and form whether religious, civil, politically, fraternal, or otherwise, which espouses a philosophy or promotes a cause which leads men away from salvation and towards the kingdoms of lesser glory in the eternal world. As the Lord said in Latter-day Revelation, Babylon is in is the myth of wickedness. That's Dr. Cummins 133.14. The phrase, Mother of Harlots and Abominations, meaning... Babylon not only is a prostitute herself, but is the mother of other prostitutes, other harlots on the earth. Not only does the woman embody one form of great wickedness on the earth, but she fosters organizations, religions, governments, philosophies, and attitudes that embrace the devil and his world. The abominations here include those spoken of Daniel, wherein the temple and other sacred things are desecrated and corrupted. And they include the evil practices of combining harlotry with idolatry. In the scriptures, Lord calls all of the following an abomination. All are engendered by Babylon, the mother of such things. Incest, homosexuality, bestiality, idolatry, offering of impure sacrifices to God, Human, offering human sacrifice, using those who practice divination, enchantments, and witchcraft, uh, using wizards, necromancers, using those who cast spells or consult the dead, transvestism, taking money earned as prostitutes into the temple to pay a vow, being dishonest in financial dealings, making idols, Sodomy, being prideful, lying, murder, contentiousness, justifying the wicked and condemning the just, 
offering sacrifice and wickedness, adultery, oppressing the poor and needy, willfully failing to pay debts, whoredoms, fornication, secret combinations, cannibalism, rape, the creeds of apostate churches. Chapter 17, verse 6, drunken with the blood of the saints and martyrs, meaning Babylon is the name of the spirit that comes over those who kill the prophets. That spirit has infected much of the world. The word drunken suggests that through the ages, the righteous have been victims of a great slaughter, a slaughter that was intoxicating to the pre perpetuators. Being drunken with the blood of the saints suggests that throughout the ages, many righteous people have been slain by the wicked. The scriptural language suggests that the slain of the righteous had an intoxicating effect on those who carried out the slaughter. The phrase, when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, meaning John does, John does not admire this embodiment of great wickedness. A better translation of the Greek word here would be astonishment. John is amazed or astonished at the extreme level of Babylon's wickedness. While serving in the 70s, Donald Elder David R. Stone spoke of this pervasive corruption. Quote, there is no particular city today which personifies Babylon. Babylon was, in the time of ancient Israel, a city which had become sensual, de decadent, and corrupt. That sensuality, corruption, and decadence, and the worship of false gods are to be seen in many cities, great and small, scattered across the globe. As the Lord has said, they seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world. What an insidious thing in this culture amidst which we live. It permeates our environment. End of quote. Chapter 17, 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore dost thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery. The angel serves as the guide and interpreter for John and for us through John's vision, offering to explain the mystery of the woman, the beast on which she sits, and the seven heads and ten horns of the beast. 17.8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. The beast that John saw in Revelation 13 received what seemed to be a mortal wound, but she was healed and given life again to the astonishment of the world. That beast was, meaning at one time it existed, but it is not, meaning that at the time of John's vision it no longer existed on the earth. So where was it? Perhaps in the bottomless pit, which is symbol of the poison in which Satan will the prison which is symbol of the prison in which Satan will be kept. Yet some time after John's vision, the beast will come forth from the bottomless pit to continue to work its evil work on the earth. For instance, after the two witnesses have completed their work on earth, the beast who ascended from the bottomless pit will make war against them and kill them. The phrase goeth into perdition meaning perdition is the eternal dwelling place of Satan and those who conscientiously choose him instead of the light. One of Satan's names is perdition. These followers are called the sons of perdition. Perdition is used to translate the Greek apolia, which means destruction and which likely stem from apolumi, which means ruin or loss. In the end, the beast, meaning all those who embrace and supported that which the beast does, will be cast into perdition with Satan, his master. They that dwell upon the earth shall wonder, meaning in 13.3 we read that all the world wondereth after the beast when he was healed of his fatal wound. This seems to be a repetition of that same incident. The phrase whose names were not written in the book of life. This phrase helps us to identify those who will wonder at the beast, all those who have not truly come unto Christ and have and been claimed as his. 
We have the same qualifier in 13.8, which says that all people on earth will worship the beast except those whose names are written in the book of the Lamb. The phrase from the foundation of the world, meaning the foundation of the world is the creation. Those whose names have been written in the book of life from the creation will not wonder at the beast. Perhaps this passage refers to the Lord's foreknowledge of those who will come unto exaltation. Or it may refer to the collective group of the righteous whose names were written in the book of life beginning with Adam and Eve. The phrase, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. We read at the beginning of the verse that the beast was and is not. Here we read that the beast yet is. He lived, he died, and now he lives again. This is perhaps a parody of the lamb who was put to death yet came back to life and is now his life forevermore. The description is also an in intentional antithesis to the one who is, who was, and who is to come, meaning Christ. In the broadest sense, the beast is the satanically inspired power, which, although having received the stroke of death, refers to hurl himself with renewed fury against the forces of God. It is this incredible power of resuscitation that caused the inhabitants of the earth to stand in awe. He is the beast of chapter 13 who has received a death stroke in one of his heads and yet survived. Down through history, he repeatedly comes up out of the abyss to harass and, if it were possible, to destroy the people of God. The beast was, at the moment, he is not. John wrote, under the shadow of an impending persecution, the beast is about to come again. This coming will be his last, for now the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, will throw him, along with the false prophets, alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That's Revelation 19, 19, 20. 17, verse 9, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. This expression is similar to that found in a comparable setting in 13, 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. In other words, Wisdom and thoughtful searching will bring the understanding in this chapter. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. The beast or political, philosophical, economical, religious power that gives the woman her headquarters or base of operations has seven heads, which the angel tells us represents seven mountains. <coughs> Excuse me. Rome is the traditional city on seven hills. Yet John may be referring not to little Rome, but the Rome as a symbol of all that is powerful and corrupt in the world. The number seven indicates perfection or completion. In this case, complete corruption or perfectly evil power. In other words, the woman's headquarters in any age is an evil power as Rome was in John's day. Chapter 17, verse 10, and there are seven kings. The exact identity of the seven kings is not known. The precise identity of the kings, however, is not as important as their function in the vision. The seven kings may represent many kings of the earth, and the number seven, which indicates perfection or completeness, may tell us that all the kings of the earth as a whole are part of the beast and supportive of the evil women. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet to come, meaning of the seven kings symbolized by the beast's seven heads, five were already dead at the time of John's vision. The sixth was reigning at the time, and the seventh had not yet been born or come to power. Ultimately, we can only speculate as to whom these kings might be. The phrase, when he cometh, he must, come up, he must continue a short space, meaning... The sixth king had already come to power when John had his vision, but he would reign for only a short time. John saw that the beast was and is not. He also saw a vision of seven kings, five are fallen and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. John's language suggests that wickedness of the world will be temporary. 1711, the beast that was and is not. 
This beast is the same one identified and discussed in 13, 1 through 8. The phrase, even he, is the eighth and is of the seven, meaning the beast has seven heads that represent seven kings, but the beast himself is also a king, the eighth in the series, yet at the same time of the seven. This is pro obviously a paradox, one without an easy answer. Some argue that Nero was one of the seven and that according to the myth, he returned. Apparently, many in the first century, presumably including some of the saints, believed in this myth. Some believe that Nero had not died at all but had gone into hiding. Others argue that evil, bloodthirsty domination was a reincarnation of the devil, bloodthirsty Nero. I'm sorry, reincarnation of the evil, bloodthirsty Nero. But by now, both Nero and Domination have long since perished, yet the beast continues in the latter days as part of the seventh seal, and he will be presented at the destruction of Babylon at the last day. Perhaps the best transcendence of all other kings, perhaps he, as Antichrist, is of the seven, in the sense that his evil purposes is fulfilled in them, and as the eighth he may fulfill all all that the others set in motion and sought to accomplish. The phrase engulfed into perdition. This experience reiterates that the beast will be defeated and banished from the earth. 1712, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. These ten kings all seem to reign during the same general period. They are united in their support of the beast and his principles and goals. The number ten here seems to signify the whole of a part. The king symbolized here might be representative of all the kings and kingdoms of the world except gods, particularly those when the world is ripe in wickedness. The phrase, which have received no kingdom as yet, meaning the kings represented by the ten horns are all in John's future, and the prophecy seems to suggest that they will hold power during the seventh seal when they will unite against the whore. However, they are not government leaders since they have no kingdom, but seem to be people who have great influence and power. That could be like the WEF and other organizations of the wealthy that are very powerful and influence governments today. The re phrase, receive power as kings one hour with the beast, meaning these kings will receive their power from the beast, but they will hold it only for a short time. Chapter 17, verse 13. These have one mind. The ten kings have one united purpose, which is to support the beast. That mind and purpose are inspired by the master of the beast, Satan himself. President Joseph Fielding Smith stated, quote, Satan has control now. No matter where you look, he is in control, even in our own land. He is guiding the governments as far as the Lord will permit him. That is why there is so much strife, turmoil, and confusion and all over the earth. One mastermind is governing the nation. It is not the President of the United States. It is not Hitler. It is not Mussolini. It is not the governments of England or any other land. It is Satan himself. End of quote. And the phrase, and he and shall give their power and strength in the beast, meaning the ten kings will lend their support to the principles and philosophies and goals of the evil king and evil kingdoms that is called the beast. Revelation seventeen fourteen, war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome. Though the scene John saw in Revelation seventeen can seem frightening. He also saw that the Lamb shall overcome the wickedness of the world. The Lamb, of course, is Jesus Christ. The war is part of the war that began in heaven and continues as the beast tries to destroy the true believers in Christ. This war will come to a bloody conclusion at Armageddon. The phrase, the Lamb shall overcome them, meaning Christ will be victorious over all his enemies retaining all power, even to the destroying of Satan and his works at the end of the world and the last great day of judgment. This event, when Christ will conquer all at his second coming, is discussed in much greater detail in 1911-21. President Gordon B. Hinckley affirmed that the Lord and his people will prevail in the war against evil. 
quote, in the October Conference of 19, 1896, President Wilford Woodruff said, there are two powers on the earth and in the midst of the inhabitants of the earth, the power of God and the power of the devil. When God has had a people on the earth, it matters not in what age Lucifer, the son of the morning, and the millions of fallen spirits that were cast out of heaven have warred against God, against Christ. The war goes on. This is waged across the world over the issue of agency and compulsion. It is waged by an army of missionaries over the issue of truth and error. It is waged in our own lives, day in and day out, in our homes, in our work, in our schools, associations. It is waged over questions of love and respect, of loyalty and fidelity, of obedience and integrity. We are all involved in it. We are winning, and the future never looked brighter. End of quote. Chapter 17, verse 14. They that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Those who attend the Lamb in overcoming his enemies are those who have overcome the world. This seems to be the same group that is described in 14.4. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. And they continue with him at the second coming as seen in 19.14. And the armies which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Some of the called and chosen, of course, will still be alive as mortals at the second coming. In one sense, to be called and chosen is to come to priesthood blessings and power in which one must be faithful. This phrase may also refer to those who have had their calling and election made sure. 17. Verse 15, the waters which thou sawest are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Here the angel gives a clear interpretation of where the whore is located among all peoples of the earth. 1716, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. Though they once sustained and assisted the whore in her evil work on earth, as allies of the beast that supported her, in the end the ten kings will turn on her and destroy her, which will also bring their own destruction. Nephi saw the same event, and, quote, and the blood of the great and abominable church, which the whore of all the earth, shall turn on upon their own heads, for they shall war among themselves, and the sword of their own hands shall fall upon their own heads, and they shall be drunken with their own blood. That's 1 Nephi 22, 13. 17, verse 16. She'll make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, burn with fire. Meaning, here is a paradox. Though the ten horns, ten kings, grow from the beast, a kingdom and, idol and ideology, as well as a specific king, and although the horns support and sustain the beast, and although the beast supports and sustains the whore, the church of the devil, the wicked world, yet the horns shall turn on the whore and help to destroy her. An old proverb, proverb says that there is no honor among thieves, meaning that though thieves may be allies for a time, in the end they will steal from each other. The Book of Mormon says that by the wicked will the wicked be punished, Mormon 4.5. Elsewhere it says that Satan will abandon his followers at the last days, Alma 3060. In the same way, those who do the work of the devil often turn on each other. These kings will not suddenly become righteous, but will seek their own flesh and <clears throat> but will seek their own flesh ends in destroying the whore, not realizing that by their actions they will also destroy themselves. Perhaps the crazed self-destruction of the Nephites and Jerusites illustrates the mindless killing described here. The fate of the whore is striking. Instead of the fiery finery that she once wore, the king will strip her naked. Instead of drinking from a golden cup, she herself will be consumed by those who turn on her like wild animals. Instead of being drunken with the blood of the martyrs, she herself will be killed. The particular method by which she is killed is important to note. Under the law of Moses, any daughter of a priest who chose to prof profane herself by playing the whore is to be burned with fire. 
Revelation 18.8 gives further details about the burning of Babylon. Ultimately, of course, Babylon, or the wicked world, will be destroyed by the fire of the coming of the Lord. 17.17 For the God hath put into their hearts to, fill, to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast. Though the kings likely do not know it, they serve God's greater purpose in supporting the beast for a time. It has not been revealed why this is part of the Lord's plan. Quote, until, or the phrase, until the word of God are fulfilled, meaning God has a plan which has been prophesied through his servants. All will proceed according to the divine will until it is accomplished. In particular, in this instant, God has decreed that the kingdom of the wicked must be destroyed. 1718, And the woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Meaning, who is the whore? She is the church of the devil, as we have seen. She is the source and instigator of great sin on the earth. She is mysterious and secretive, and she is a political entity, a city, as well as great gathering of people. For a time, she has control of the other kingdoms of the earth, but eventually they will betray her and contribute to her destruction. In the time of John, Rome was the great city and the very essence of evil, but Rome is only one manifestation of Babylon, which can be found in one form or another until the end. The seat and embodiment of evil is found in governments, societies, churches, and other associations of humans on the earth in all ages. <clears throat> we now turn to Revelation chapter 18. The saints are called out of Babylon, that is, out of the world, which is spiritual Babylon. In the first and last book of the Bible, Babylon incarnates arrogance, pride, insatiable corruption, and opposition to God and his kingdom. It stands in contrast to the heavenly city, the New Jerusalem, where the law of God thrives. Babylon represents a real historical organization. It is composed of more than one entity. Seeing spiritual Babylon as only one association, either at its inception or today would therefore be wrong. It symbolizes all leagues that may properly be called Antichrist, that pervert the right way of the Lord, and that promote ancient anti-Christian principles and lifestyles. The arrogant Babylonians combine purely sensual and material principles with the lofty striving within the soul of man. Out of this new out of this grew the principle of spiritual fornication. Men mistook lust for joy, sought happiness through passion, and pursued security through materialism. The bit of graffiti, he who dies with the most toys wins, could have been written as easily in Babylon as in New York or Las Vegas. Today many seem to still today many still seek to find heaven through drugs, lust, money, success, or power. People continue to try to escape the deadly round of daily life through material and immoral means. God has provided a solution. Flee Babylon. The command demands a complete severing of relations. God allows no association whatsoever. There is good reason. Babylon is not to be converted, but destroyed. See, that, that is not why the second coming happens. That all of a sudden, Babylon is converted and everyone is righteousness. No, God will destroy Babylon so that only the righteous prevail. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not to be healed. Forsake her. Any that linger in Babylon will be taken with her plagues, for after today cometh the burning, and I will not, spell, I will not spare any that remain in Babylon. Elder Orson Pratt adds this testimony, quote, John predicts another great event to take place immediately after the proclamation of the everlasting gospel, namely the downfall of great Babylon. She must fall after she has been warned with the sound of the everlasting gospel. Her overthrow will be by a series of most terrible judgments, which will quickly succeed each other and sweep over the nations where she has her dominion. And at last she will be burned by, utterly burned by fire, for thus saith the Lord, 
For thus hath the Lord spoken. Great and fearful and most terrible judgments are decreed upon those corrupt powers and nations of modern Christendom. For strong is the Lord who shall execute his fierce wrath upon them, and he will not cease until he has made a full end and until their names be blotted out from under heaven. Chapter 18, verse 1, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. John now beholds a powerful angel, different from the angels that guided him through the vision of chapter 17. The phrase, the earth was lightened with his glory, meaning this angel is so brilliant that the very earth is illuminated by his presence. In fact, this angel's glory is like that of Christ, who will yet return. And behold, the glory of God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. That's Ezekiel 43.2. For as the lightning of the sun cometh out of the east, and shineth even to the west, so, also, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24.27. Chapter 18, verse 2, And he cried mightily with a strong voice. The power of the angel's proclamation equals the power of his appearance. His cry is mighty, and his voice is strong. The phrase, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. The angel's words are almost a direct quotation from a passage in Isaiah, quote, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground, Isaiah 21, 9. This same expression is found in later day, latter day scripture. Quote, and again, another angel shall so sound his trump, which is the sixth angel, saying, She is fallen who has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and she is fallen, is fallen. Dr. Covenants 88 105. The phrase, the inhabitants of devil, foul spirits, hateful birds, meaning, where once Babylon boasted of being the great and powerful city that controlled kings and was the site of opulence and wealth, it now is not fit for human habitation. Rather than being a city of kingdom with a desired place in the world, it is now the home of devils, foul spirits, and unclean birds. This symbolic description emphasizes that the mighty Babylon will be brought to the lowest possible point. Old Testament prophets saw the fall, fallen city of Babylon as a wasteland good only for foul and unclean creatures. Revelation 18, 3-4, Choosing Righteousness Despite the Prevalence of Modern Wickedness. Revelation 18 proclaims the fall of wicked Babylon and describes the lamentation of all who associate with her. In all ages, the Lord has commanded his people to come out of Babylon and not be partakers of her sins. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles testified that it is possible to follow the Lord's teachings and avoid being contaminated by the Lord's wickedness. Quote, Much of the world is being engulfed in a rising river of degenerate filth with the abandonment of virtue, righteousness, personal integrity, traditional marriage, and family life. Despite pockets of evil, the world overall is majestically beautiful, filled with many good and sincere people. God has provided a way to live in this world and not be contaminated by the degenerating pressures evil agents spread throughout it. You can live a virtuous, productive, righteous life by following the plan of protection created by your Father in Heaven, His plan of happiness. End of quote. Revelation 18, 3, 7 through 16, The Wealth and Materialism of Babylon. John uses phrases such as wax rich and live deliciously to highlight the lust for wealth and lavish possessions that define Babylon. These riches will be destroyed, and those who have placed their hearts upon them will lament. President Harold B. Lee warned that with prosperity, Prosperity often comes the temptation to embrace the materialism of Babylon. Quote, we are tested. We are tried. We are going through some of the severest tests today, and we don't realize perhaps the severity of the test we are going through. Today, we are basking in the lap of luxury and like of which we've never seen before in the history of the world. 
it would seem that probably this is the most severe test of any test that we've ever had in the history of the church. End of quote. Isn't that interesting? The test of luxury, which can lead us to decadence, is the, the worst test we can have. Chapter 18, verse 4. Come out of her, my people. This counsel has particular application to the saints in our day. There is much in our world that partakes of the pride, the lust, the materialism, and the sins of Babylon. There is much that seeks to replace God in our hearts. The endless quest for wealth, the near worship of sports and entertainment stars, the deep desire of most people to seek and reach after their own goals rather than God's. Babylon is alive and well in our times, but as prophesied, Babylon will fall. The phrase that ye be not partaker of her sins, meaning the saints are called to leave Babylon so that they can be fortified against the temptation to partake of her sin. What are those sins? Certainly the people of Babylon are guilty of all the typical sins of mankind at their worst. Murder, adultery, abortion, theft, pornography, lying, and on and on. But in addition, as Revelation records, Babylon is also guilty of persecuting and killing the saints, leading the nations of the world into idolatry and gross wickedness and fostering all manner of abominations. Revelation 18, 5 through 6, her sins have reached unto heaven. John heard a voice from heaven proclaiming that Babylon's sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Some people might think their iniquities are hidden, but these verses are a reminder that sins do not go undetected by God, though their consequences may not all come immediately. The voice also declared that Babylon would receive the consequences of her works and would be punished doubly, reminiscent of terminology used in the law of Moses. Chapter 18, verse 7. I sit, I sit a queen and am no widow, meaning Babylon gives herself a thoroughly give gives herself so thoroughly to pride and sin that she sees herself as invisible. She rules over people of the world, a great king, queen over many kings. She fears nothing, not even death. This arrogant claim repeats a prophecy found in Isaiah, quote, And thou sittest, I say, be a lady forever, so that thou dost not lay these things to thy heart, neither dost remember the latter end of it. Therefore, hear now this, Thou that art given to pleasure, that dwellest ceaselessly, that sayest in thy heart, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. Isaiah 47, 7-8 through 8. The prophecy in Isaiah continues, foreseeing that which John also saw next. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their perfection for a multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. For thou hast trusted in the wickedness thou hast said, None seeth me. The wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. And thou shalt say in thy heart, I am, and none else beside me. Therefore desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. Isaiah 47, 9 through 11. As Revelation 18.8, 8, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. Some translations replace the word death with disease or pestilence. And one day indicates that these things will come suddenly upon the wicked. The phrase, she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her, meaning after the plague, plagues comes, after the plagues comes the burning. When the Lord returns, the wicked will be destroyed by burning, and the earth itself will be cleansed by fire. Certainly a God who has power to bring such a judgment is a strong and powerful God. 18 verse 9, The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her. These kings are probably the kings of the earth in general mentioned in 17.2. 
The kings represent the people of the earth who also have joined in the fornication. The kings of the people have joined together. The kings and the people have joined together in celebrating the idolatry, immorality, and lusts of the world. They have lived deliciously in luxury, excess, and wantonness, loving the pleasures of the world more than the treasures of God. Boy, we see this being filled today and it will yet to be filled more and more. Bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, meaning when the kings of the earth shall see the other, the utter destruction of Babylon, meaning the lifestyle and lust of wealth to which they have given themselves, they will weep and mourn for her loss. 1810, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, meaning though they regret her loss, kings try to separate themselves from Babylon for fear they will share in her fate. The phrase, alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, meaning this city of lament for the destruction of wicked Babylon is repeated three times in this chapter, once by the kings, once by the merchants, and once by the sea traders. The city is Babylon, she is the similitude. The city is Rome, but she too is only a type and a figure. The city is all the cities of the world, San Francisco, Chicago, New York City, London, Paris, Berlin, Moscow, Tokyo, Sao Paulo, all of which are subject to the rule and dominion of evil and carnality. The phrase for in one hour is thy judgment has come, meaning this expression suggests that the punishments and disasters that will overtake Babylon, symbolizing the wicked world, will come suddenly. Variations of this expression are repeated in 18, verse 17 and 19. It is worth noting that the one hour of persecution revealed in 17, 12 through 14 is balanced by the one hour of judgment in this verse. Revelation 18, 11 through 13, Merchandise and the Souls of Men. The list of merchandise sold in Babylon reveals a startling truth. People sell not only gold, precious stones, fine textiles, and many other luxury items, but even slaves and souls of men. This refers primarily to the abomination practice of human trafficking, but can also be seen as a reference to the spiritual enslavering consequences of materialism and other evils. It may also describe corrupt religious practitioners who present themselves as ministering to people's souls while seeking above all to profit financially. In this sense, they traffic in the souls of men. Moroni recorded that in the last days there shall be churches built up that shall say, Come unto me, and for your money you shall be forgiven of your sins. That's Mormon 8.32. In contrast to the gospel of Jesus Christ offers spiritual money, with spiritual nourishment without money and without price. The merchant, symbolizing all those who seek to increase their wealth by association and dealings with the godless culture, will mourn for the loss of that culture, that society, that way of life. Their mourning will be particularly poignant because of their personal loss. They will grieve for themselves more than for Babylon. Ezekiel received a vision similar to that depicted in this chapter. That's Ezekiel 27, verses 1 through 3, 12 through 24, 27, 29 through 32, and 35 through 36. Hugh Nibley called the Mayhem Principle. Here is Nibley's description of how Babylon trades in the souls of men. Quote, the story begins with Satan seeking to promote himself, even the premortal existence, and being cast out of heaven in his pride and dedicating himself upon his fall to the destruction of the earth, for he knew not the mind of God. On earth he will control the world economy by, by claiming possession of the earth's resources and by manipulation of its currency, gold and silver. He will buy up the political, military, and ecclesiastical complex and run everything his way. He not only offers employment, but of but a course of instruction on how the whole thing works, teaching the ultimate secret, the great secret of converting life, into property. 
Cain got the decree of Master Mahan, tried the system out on his brother, and gloried in its brilliant success, declaring that at last he could be free, as only property makes free, and that Abel had been a loser in a free competition. The discipline was handed down to Lemek and finally became the pattern of the world's economy. One may see mayhem at work all around, from the mafia, who adherence to principle needs no argument, down to the drug pusher, the arms dealer, the manufacturer and seller of defective products, or those who's, who poison the air and water as a shortcut to gain less shorten and sicken the lives of all their fellow creatures. Chapter 18, verse 14, the fruits that the soul lusted after, all things dainty and godly, thou shalt find them no more at all, meaning the sweet and exotic foods that the world has enjoyed will be destroyed with Babylon itself. These foods may symbolize the excess and extravagances of the world. Verse 18, verse 15, the merchants of these things stand afar off, weeping and wailing. Greedy and Greed and luxury are powerful motivators. Those who have become rich by trafficking in the things of the world feel great relief at the loss <coughs> of the source of wealth. But even in their mourning, they remove themselves from Babylon at the end of standing afar off for fear of partaking of her torment. Chapter 18, verse 16, Alas, alas, that great city, the city of the merchants, the sea traders, and the kings, and mourning the loss of Babylon, which is the wicked world, personified by the greatest riches and most powerful city in the world, is one of self-interest. They feel deeply the loss of her wealth, symbolized by the linen, the royal clothing, made of purple, scarlet, and precious metals and gems. 1817, again the phrase for in one hour is the judgment come is repeated. This expression suggests that the punishments and disasters that will overtake Babylon, symbolizing the wicked world, will come suddenly. Chapter 1818, which city is likened to this great city? When the sea traders see the destruction of Babylon, they are amazed. Babylon was so powerful and so rich, how could it be just destroyed? In the same way, those who embrace the philosophies and lifestyles of a world without the true God, which would, world seems uniquely powerful and important, will be amazed at its destruction. 1819, they cast dust on their heads. In Middle East culture, this gesture is traditionally a sign of humiliation and deep mourning. 1820, rejoice over her, thou heaven, holy apostles and prophets, meaning while the wicked kings, merchants, and tree traders mourn the loss of Babylon, heaven and the righteous have cause to rejoice. Their great nemesis, the unholy antagonist of all that is good and right, has been destroyed. The phrase, God hath avenged you on her, meaning Babylon orchestrated war against the righteous and has become drunken with the blood of the saints. But God will come down in vengeance and bring judgments upon her according to all her wickedness. This vengeance fulfills the prophecy made in Revelation 6, 9 through 11. 1821, a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea. Of those who abuse or offend the Lord's little ones, the Lord said, it was better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. This is the very fate destined for Babylon, the wicked culture, philosophy, governments, religion, and lifestyle of the world. As an object lesson, a mighty angel will lift up a huge stone and throw it into the sea, and thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. This passage may also depict some other wise undefined natural disaster. The destruction of Babylon was foreseen by Jeremiah, Jeremiah 51:37, Nephi, 1 Nephi 14, 15 through 16, and Joseph Smith, Matthew, and Joseph Smith in DSC 116, among others. 
We read in Jeremiah of this impressive prophecy, quote, So Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sarah, When thou hast made an end of reading this book, thou shalt bind a stone to it, and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates. And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and it shall not rise from that evil that I will bring upon her. Jeremiah 51, 60 through 64. Just as a weighty stone has no power to rise again from the depths of the sea, in the same way Babylon will have no power to rise again from the destruction of a just, uh, from the destruction a just God brings upon her. 1822. Harpers, musicians, pipers, trumpeters heard no more all in thee. The sounds of people seeking worldly pleasure and entertainment will be lost when Babylon is destroyed. Contrast that with the promise in Revelation 15:2, which says that those who resist the beast, gaining a personal victory over him, will have the harps of God, making music of true joy and praise. The phrase, no craftsman shall be found any more in thee, meaning daily labor for pay in the city will cease. The economy of Babylon will be destroyed along with the city. The phrase, the sound of a millstone should be heard no more at all in thee, meaning the grinding of wheat and other such daily tasks will no longer be heard in Babylon because Babylon will be no more. This prophecy has an ominous undertone. When the millstone ceases to grind, food soon ceases to be available. 1823, and the light of a candle shine no more all in thee. The city will be plunged into darkness. It will no longer have any light at all. The phrase, the voice of the bridegroom and of the ride shall be heard no more at all in thee. Of an earlier and parallel event, the Lord said, Then will I cause to cease from the city of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate. Jeremiah 7.34 The loss of such sounds indicates that normal life has stopped or that all life in that place has ceased to be. Thy merchants were gathered, I'm sorry, the phrase, thy merchants were the great men of the earth, meaning those who traded in and with Babylon were great, rich, and powerful, but they have, but they do not have power to save her. The phrase, by the sorcerers were all nations deceived. The Lord abhorred sorcery, the use of witchcraft, and evil powers to deceive others. We read in Revelation 13 the miracles of the beast, which deceived the people of the earth and caused them to worship the beast rather than God. Though the sorceries of Babylon enable her to deceive the nations and thus to rule the world, those dark satanic powers are unable to save her in the end. Isaiah 47, 12 through 14 declares, Stand now with thy, thine enchantments and with the multitude of thy sorceries. Within thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be thou shalt be able to profit, if so be thou mayest prevail, let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that thou hast come upon thee. Behold, they shall be a stubble, the, vi the fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. Revelation 18.24, The Blood of Prophets and Saints John recorded that in Babylon was found the blood of prophets and of saints, meaning that those who uphold Babylon are to blame for the martyrdom of prophets and saints throughout the world's history. At the second coming, Babylon and its inhabitants will be recompensed for their evil works, for the blood of the martyrs will stand as a testimony against those who have slain them. This persecution of the righteous is probably Babylon's greatest sin. That these things were found in Babylon at the end suggests that all her wickedness will be uncovered. A similar time of judgment was recorded in 3 Nephi 8 through 9 when the whole cities were destroyed, that the blood of the prophets and the saints shall not come any more unto me against them. We now turn to Revelation chapter 19. 
Revelation 19, 1 through 6, praising the Lord and his judgment. John heard the inhabitants of heaven crying, Alleluia, which means praise the Lord. This praise was in response to God's righteous judgment upon Babylon, knowing that God is a God of judgment and enables saints to endure in faith. No sooner is the idea of the existence of God planted in the minds of men than it gives power to the mind for the exercise of faith and confidence in God, and they are enabled by faith to lay hold on the promises which are set before them and wade through all the tribulations and afflictions to which they are subject by reason of the persecution from those who know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, believing that in due time the Lord will come out in swift judgment against them. Knowing that God will one day judge the enemies of his people can help saints in the last days to endure in patience and faith. Revelation 19.1 Salvation and glory, honor, and power unto Lord our God. The inhabitants of the heavenly city out cry out praise to God. I'm sorry, the inhabitants of heaven cry out praise to God, acknowledging that all honor and glory for the work of salvation and the earth go to him. The King James Version salvation may more properly be rendered victory. The expression Lord our God indicates that the Lord is a personal God to us, one that we can claim as our own. 19.2 For true and righteous are his judgments. At this verse, as this verse tells us, the Lord has made a judgment against the great whore, which is correct, fair, and right. All of God's judgments are true and righteous. If he were to judge otherwise, as Alma taught, he would cease to be God. The phrase, he avenges the blood of his saints at her hand, meaning, in Revelation 6, 9-10, John saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The question is answered in the last days when the Lord exercises his mighty, terrible judgments against the wicked. The events that bring down the downfall of Babylon are the same as those that, he, that avenge the blood of the martyrs of the Lord. 19.3. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. The smoke of the destruction of Babylon will rise up to the heavens forever as a testimony of her wickedness. As the smoke of incense rises up to God as prayer, so will the smoke of the destruction, I'm sorry, the smoke of the destroyed Babylon rise up as a reminder of her sins and just destruction of the wicked world. 19.5. And a voice came out of the throne. Because of this voice comes out of the throne of God, it may appear to be the voice of God himself. But the words spoken by the voice, praise our God, imply that the voice is not that of God the Father. It could be the voice of Jesus commanding the saints to praise the Father, though Jesus likely would have said, my God. The speaker may be one of those surrounded the throne, or one of those who surround the throne. 19 verse 6, the voice of a great multitude as the voice of many waters. The noisy sound of a huge rushing river or the crashing breakers of the ocean is a very apt description of the sound of an immense crowd of people. The phrase as the voice of mighty thunderings. Again, this is a very apt description of the sound of many people. The phrase saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. To paraphrase this passage, praise Jehovah, for the Lord God has power over all reigns as kings over all the earth. This is the fourth cry of Alleluia recorded in Revelation 19. Unlike the others, which praised him for his judgments against Babylon, this cry praises God for coming to bless and reign over the saints. The establishment of Christ's reign is the fulfillment of the the request made in the Lord's Prayer, Thy Kingdom Come. <clears throat> Revelation nineteen seven through 9 The Marriage Supper of the Lamb Immediately before seeing in vision the Lord's second coming, John heard a voice proclaim, The marriage of the Lamb is come, and blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
Israel's covenant relationship with God is symbolically portrayed in Scripture as a marriage covenant. Marriage is the relationship that requires the most fidelity, sacrifice, commitment, and long-suffering of all relationships. The marriage supper of the Lamb is a symbolic reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, In the dispensation, the bridegroom, who is the Lamb of God, shall come to claim his bride, which is the church, composed of the faithful saints who have watched for his return. As he taught in the parable of the marriage of the king's son, the great marriage supper of the Lamb shall be celebrated. John saw that the Lamb's bride was clothed in fine linen made white, clean and white through the atonement. This imagery of a bride dressed in white presents a stark contrast to the harlot in extravagant apparel described in Revelation, who symbolize spiritual Babylon. Only the righteous will be called to the marriage supper. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, Those who keep the commandments of the Lord and walk in his statutes to the end are the only individuals permitted to sit at this glorious feast. Reflect for a moment, brothers and sisters, and inquire whether you would consider yourself worthy of a seat at the marriage feast. End of quote. Revelation 9.10, And I fell at the feet to worship him. See that ye, thou do it not. John has seen many angels in his vision and interacted with several of them, and he has not been inclined to worship any of them, perhaps with praises going forth from much people in heaven, those who surround the throne and a great multitude of the servants of God, and with the angel's promise of the sublime blessing of the marriage of the bridegroom and the bride, John is overcome and bows before the angel or perhaps with the glory of the angel and the majesty and power of his words, John mistakes the messenger of the Lord for the Lord himself. In 1, 10 to 18, John sees the Lord himself and appropriately bows before him, and the Lord blesses him in his worship. There the Lord says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. In 22, 12 to 13, a heavenly being says, Behold, I come quickly. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. The person speaking is an angel, speaking for the Lord. Immediately before the words, John has sought again to fall before the angel in worship, and again John has been warned to worship only God. With an angel having authority to stand in the place of Christ, appearing in great glory, and speaking the very words of Christ, it is understandable how John could mistake the identity of the visitor. The phrase, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, President Joseph F. Smith said, quote, We are told by the prophet Joseph Smith that there are no angels who minister to this earth, but those who do boo but to those who do belong or have belonged to it. Hence, when messengers are sent to minister to the inhabitants of this earth, they are not strangers, but from the ranks of our kindred, friends, and fellow beings, and fellow servants. End of quote. Revelation 19.10, Worship God. God is the only being or thing we may appropriately worship. Only worship of God brings eternal blessings. When Satan sought to entice Jesus to worship him, Jesus responded, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, him only shalt thou serve. Who is the God we worship, and how do we worship him appropriately? Doctrine and Covenants 93 gives us some deep truths on the matter. There the Lord says that he has given us a revelation that you may understand and know how to worship and know what you worship. We worship a being who is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, who is one with the Father and who receiveth the fullness of the Father. This is all from Doctrine and Covenants 93. That's verses 2 through 3. He is the light and the redeemer of the world. In him was the life of men and the light of men, and he is the creator of all. Verse 10. He is full of grace and truth. Verse 11. He receiveth a fullness of the glory of the Father. 
verse 16. He receives all power, both in heaven and on earth, and the glory of the Father was with him, for he dwelt with him. Verse 17. And he receiveth the fullness of truth, yea, even all truth. Verse 26. The Father whom we worship is the source of the glory and power held by the Son. How we worship is learned from the pattern shown in that same section. True worship is to follow the Son, to receive all that the Father will grant us to obey the Lord in all things. True worship, then, is not a practice or attitude found only on the Sabbath or in the temple or in prayer, but in our very attitude of life. Doctrine and Covenants 93 gives us the following clues to this divine pattern. Christ received of his Father, verse 5, and so must we, partaking of his blessings and receiving his presence through the Spirit, and likewise receiving of and doing his will. Christ received not of the fullness at first, but received grace for grace, verse 12, and so must we, worshiping God by receiving all that he gives us and by giving forth gifts and blessings to others. Christ received of the Holy Ghost, verse 15, and so must we. Christ was fully obedient to the Father in all things, and we must be obedient to him through the Son, keeping his commandments, which is a key to receiving grace for grace. Verse 20, as Christ is the firstborn of the Father, so must we be begotten through Christ, that we may be partakers of, his go- of the glory of God. Verses 21 and 22. It appears that all of this is part of true worship of God. <clears throat> Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The angel who spoke to John said that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Elder D. F. Utdorf, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that a testimony of Jesus Christ is a gift received through divine revelation. Quote, we cannot depend on the testimony of others we need to know for ourselves. The source of this sure knowledge and confirmed conviction is divine revelation, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We receive this testimony when the Holy Spirit speaks to the Spirit within us. We will receive a calm and unwavering certainty that we will be the source that will be the source of our testimony and conviction irrespective of our culture, race, language, or socioeconomic background. These promptings of the Spirit, rather than human logic alone, will be the true foundation upon which our testimony will be built. The core of this testimony will always be the fit be the faith in and knowledge of Jesus Christ and his divine mission. End of quote. President John Taylor taught the testimony of Jesus was the very principle, essence, and power of the spirit of prophecy whereby the ancient prophets were inspired. Some of our latter-day leaders have taught that the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit of prophecy are virtually equivalent. President Wilford Woodruff wrote, that, quote, it is the privilege of every man and woman in this kingdom to enjoy the spirit of prophecy, which is the spirit of God, unquote. Elder Delbert L. Stapley stated that, quote, the Holy Ghost is the spirit of prophecy, unquote. Another way to put it is that those who live righteously have claim to the Holy Spirit of God, which gives them as one of his gifts the spirit of prophecy. The formula for receiving the spirit of prophecy is given in Alma 17, 2 through 3. The key requirements appear to be diligent scripture, search, much fasting, and much prayer. Now, quote, these sons of Mosiah had waxed strong in the knowledge of the truth, for they were men of sound understanding, and they had searched the scriptures diligently, that they might know the word of God. But this is not all. They had given themselves to much prayer and fasting. Therefore, they had the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of, re- of revelation. Alma, that's Alma 17, 2 through 3. Revelation 19, verses 11, 13, a white horse and a vesture dipped in blood. In this vision of the second coming, John saw the Savior riding a white horse. Revelation 19, 11. The white horse is a symbolic 
is symbolic of conquest and victory as horses were used almost exclusively for war in John's time. To ride a horse into battle is to go forth in strength and power. John also saw that the Savior would return to earth wearing a vesture dipped in blood, meaning that his garments will be the color of blood. This color cons calls to mind the Savior's suffering in Gethsemane when his atoning blood was pressed from his body, just as juice is pressed from grapes in a wine press. Commenting on the Savior's red robes, Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve stated, quote, Having bled at every pore, how red his remnant must have been in Gethsemane, how crimson that cloak. No wonder when Christ comes in power and glory that he will come in reminding red attire, signifying not only the winepress of wrath, but also to bring to our remembrance how he suffered for each of us in Gethsemane and on Calvary. End of quote. <clears throat> The blood on Christ's clothing symbolizes at least three things. The blood Christ shed in performing the atonement, the blood or sins of the wicked that the world, that he took upon himself. Blood and sins are equated in Jacob 1.19. <clears throat> See also 1 Peter 3.18, Alma 33.22, and 35.11.11. And the blood of the unrepented wicked he has slain in his wrath. Revelation 19.11, and he that sat upon him is called faith, faithful and true. These two titles of Christ give two of his primary characteristics. Christ is called faithful in Revelation 1.5 and true in Revelation 3.7. Here the characteristics are combined. He is faithful in that he holds steadfast to the right and keeps all promises. He is true in that he acts always in accordance with true and righteous principles. The phrase, in righteousness doth he judge, meaning the Father has given the right and responsibility of judging the world and all the individuals in the world to his Son. As God our Savior is not capable of rendering unrighteous and unfair judgment, this judgment will vindicate the righteous and punish the wicked. The phrase, and make war, meaning that the Lord is a God of mercy, blessing his children with loving kindness, but he is also a God of justice, rendering judgment to all people on the earth. He is the Prince of Peace, but he is also a man of war, mighty in battle. His title, Lord of Hosts, suggests that he is the commander of the angelic host of heaven as they go forth to war against the wicked. 1912, he had on his head many crowns. The many crowns on the head of Christ represents the truth proclaimed in Revelation 11:15. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Contrast the many crowns of Christ with the seven worn by Satan, the dragon, and the ten worn by the beast. The crowns worn by the Lord are not specified in number. He has more than all other kings combined. He is the King of King and Lord of Lords, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in the world, but also in that which is to come. The phrase, a name written that no man knew but himself, meaning in the book of Revelation, a name on the forehead seems to identify the person who bears it. In Revelation 17, 5, the whore had a name on her forehead that identified her as the great, uh, identified her as Babylon the Great, the mother of abominations. In Revelation 14, 1, the 144,000 had the Father's name written on their forehead, suggesting that they belonged to him. Here the Lord has a name written on his, his forehead, but it, is not but it is not to identify him to others, because only he himself knows it. As with all glorified beings, our Lord has a new name in celestial exaltation, a name known to and comprehended by those only who know God, and in the sense that they have become as he is and have eternal life. See Revelations 2, 12-17. Thus Christ's new name shall be written upon all those who are joint heirs with him, and shall signify that they have become even as he is, and he 
even as the Father. 1914, the armies which are in heaven followed him. One of the Lord's titles is Lord of Hosts. The word host is used to translate the Lord, <clears throat> the word Tzabah, which generally means armies. Christ is the Lord of the armies of heaven. The armies include the mighty angels that Paul explained would return with Christ, and many also include the latter day church and the departed faithful. Those with the Lamb in the war are those who are called and chosen and faithful. The 144,000 follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. Perhaps these righteous ones of the earth join the armies of heaven after death or perhaps after their resurrection. Those who follow Christ here follow him in the life to come. The phrase upon white horses, the armies of heaven following Christ, have white horses like their master going to war in strength and power which shall be victorious. The phrase clothed in fine linen, white and clean, meaning the armies of heaven are arrayed in fine white linen as the bride of Christ is, or perhaps they are so arrayed because they are the bride. Revelation 19, 15 through 16, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. The Joseph Smith translation of Revelation 19, 15 clarifies how Jesus Christ shall rule the earth. Quote, and out of his mouth proceedeth the word of God, and with it he will smite the nations, and he will rule them with the word of his mouth. And he tread past the winepress in the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. See Revelation 19.15 footnote A. Paul taught that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Elsewhere he wrote, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. The returning Christ will use the word as a powerful weapon, and with the power of the word he will smite the wicked and destroy the nations of the earth. The titles of the Savior recorded in Revelation 19.16, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, make clear that Jesus Christ will rule over the whole earth and over every earthly ruler. He will also rule over heavenly kings and lords. The phrase, he will rule them with the word of his mouth, meaning the power of God is often found in his word. Not only will he smite the nations with his word, but he will also rule them with that word. 1916, and he hath on a vesture and on his thigh a name written. The vesture is probably that which is dipped in blood, but the name is different from the name mentioned in 1912, which no man knew. The name here is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It is uncertain why the name is written on his thigh, but the outer thigh would be prominently visible on a horseman. Some interpret this phrase to mean that the name was actually written on the garment that covered his thigh. Others believe that the name was written on the sword at his side, resting on or next to his thigh. Of course, the purpose of this symbolic picture is to emphasize the supremacy of the Lord. Revelation 19, 17 through 18 and 21, the supper of the great God. The slain will be so many that the fowls of the air will be invited to come and feast on the corpses. This is called the Supper of the Great God. John saw the ultimate destruction of the wicked when their slain bodies would be eaten by carrion birds. Ezekiel prophesied of this same destruction. This dreadful Supper of the Great God stands in stark contrast to the joyful marriage supper of the Lamb vividly highlighting that the second coming of Christ will be very different experience for the wicked than for the righteous. The Joseph Smith translation of Revelation 19.18 clarifies that these verses describe the destruction of only all who fight against the Lamb. See Revelation 19.18 footnote A. Elder Bruce Saul McConkie wrote, Those with refined senses find it difficult to conceive of the desolation, destruction, and death that will prevail during the final great battles, ushering in Christ's reign of peace. So great shall be the slaughter and mass murder, the carnage and gore, the butchery and violence, death 
of warring men that their decaying bodies shall stop the noses of passengers. It shall be a task of mammoth proportions merely to dispose of them. Then shall Ezekiel prophesy, prophecy be fulfilled that every feathered fowl and every beast of the field shall assemble to eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth. That all of this is an actual literal supper, an horrible but real event yet to be, has been specifically confirmed in latter days. Dr. Cummins 29, 18-21. End of quote. 1919, the beast king's armies make war with him that sat on the horse. John again sees the beast he first saw in chapter 13. The continuing battle of wicked kingdoms and philosophies against the Lamb was first begun in the war in heaven, continued when the beast rose to power on the earth, and will reach its culmination at Armageddon. Of course, the battles between Satan and Christ do not always involve armies and bloodshed. In fact, such battles may be the exception rather than the rule. Often Satan engages in a war of words, of ideas, seeking to win hearts and souls. In all cases, the eventual outcome is assured. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Some of his great false philosophies and ideas that he uses to fight the saints is critical race theory, is diversity, identity, and inclusion, and all other of these false philosophies that Satan comes up with, and the systematic racism that they say is so prevalent upon the earth to divide the people and to try to divide us rather than unite us. Chapter 19, verse 20, the beast was taken. John knew in advance, as can we, by witness from the Spirit, that the terrible beast, which had such power, will be conquered, and all the false prophets that followed it. By the omnipotence of Christ, the Lord shall all, <clears throat> the, the Lord over all. These both were cast into a lake of fiery burning with brimstone. I beheld even until the beast was slain, Daniel said, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. The worst of all fates awaits the beast and the false prophets which conspire together as an antichrist to thwart the work of the Lord through the deception and bloodshed. They will not be slain in the sense that the beast and false prophets are individual beings. This may be because a spirit cannot be killed in the in the sense that the beasts and false prophets are philosophies and ideologies, this may be because such can never be destroyed, but only removed from a given place and time. Rather, they shall be thrown alive into the worst place imaginable, a burning lake of fire. Although the actual word Gehenna is not used in Revelation, that is what John refers to as the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Gehenna, uh, a, a abbreviation for Valley of the Son of Hinnom, was the name given to the valley lying to the south and west of Jerusalem, the modern Wadi Er Rababi, as the site of a cultic shrine where human sacrifices were offered. It acquired an unholy reputation because of prophetic denunciation of this place of terrible wickedness. It came to be equated with the hell of final judgment. In New Testament times, Gehenna was a place of fire and the abode of the wicked dead. In our passage, the fiery lake is said to burn with sulfur, a yellow substance that burns redly in air. A lake of fire burning sulfur would not only be intensely hot, but malodious and fetrid, having an offensive smell as well. It is an appropriate place for all that is sinful and wicked in the world. The Antichrist and the false prophets are its first inhabitants. Later, the devil, death, and Hades, and all evil people will join them in the place of ceaseless torment. Joseph Smith taught that this terrible punishment, a man is his own tormentor and his own condemner, hence the saying, they shall go into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The torment of disappointment in the mind of man 
is as exquisite as a lake burning with fire and brimstone, I say, so is the torment of man. End of quote. 19 verse 21, the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. After the beast and the false prophets are cast into the fiery lake, the Lord slays their followers by the power of his word. Interestingly, although we know the Lord brings his armies with him to face the armies of evil, we have no details of the battle. In fact, from this verse, it appears that the Lord sim himself simply van vanquishes the enemy through his power. But it could well be that the Lord also commands his followers to engage in the battle in the strength of his power. Latter-day scholar Richard Draper observes concerning the power of the word, quote, The only weapon the prophets need to defeat the enemy host and to establish peace on the earth is in the proclamation of the gospel. End of quote. The phrase, all the fowls were filled with flesh, meaning the fowls were earlier invited to come forth and be filled with the flesh of the wicked. Here they respond and are filled indeed. We now turn to chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. 20 verse 1, bottomless pit. The bottomless pit is a term for the realm of Satan and those who follow him. Even there God holds supreme authority, for it is God's angel who has the key of the bottomless pit. In an attempt to convey an imperfect more to convey in imperfect mortal language the infinite intensity of the suffering of those cast into the pit, that is, into hell, John spoke not simply of the pit, but of the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit is the depths of hell. It is not a literal pit without a bottom, for such is a contradiction in terms. But it is a pit or prison where the inhabitants suffer as mortals view suffering to an infinite, unlimited, and bottomless extent, referring to finite inability to comprehend the vastness of the suffering of those reaping the full measure of this status. The Revelation says, The end, the width, the height, the depth, the misery thereof, they understand not, neither any man except those who are ordained unto this condemnation. We do not know the identity of this angel, but obviously it is a being with great power. Perhaps it is Michael who has a special commission to fight and defeat Satan. We do know that Michael as the seventh angel is given the privilege of proclaiming victory of the Lamb. Ultimately, of course, it is Christ who holds the key of hell and who gives the key to whomever he chooses to accomplish his work. The phrase, a, gate, a great chain in his hand, meaning not only will the devil be cast into prison, but he will be bound there by a chain, suggesting shackles and re-emphasizing there is no hope of his escape. Revelation 20, verse 2, Satan will be bound. John saw that Satan will be bound at the beginning of the millennium, and that for a thousand years he would deceive the nations no more. Or as modern revelation states, not have power to tempt any more. During this time, children shall grow without sin unto salvation. Concerning Satan's binding, President Joseph F. Smith stated, As to whether the binding of Satan is literal binding as with a chain or not, it matters not. I am inclined to believe that the chain spoken of in the Bible with which Satan is bound is more figurative than real. Satan will be bound both by the faith of the righteous and the decrees of the Almighty during the millennial reign and will be cast down into hell. 20 verse, two, 20 verse 2, he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil of Satan, and bound him. This verse gives us in one place the four names and titles John calls the adversary, making certain that we know the identity of our enemy throughout the revelation, the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and Satan. It is important to know that this is the angel who captures and binds the devil, not the inhabitants of the earth, but who remains bound because the people refuse to hearken to him. So the actual binding of Satan will be by Christ. That he remains bound will be because of the righteousness of the saints. Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated, When we speak of the binding of Satan in connection with the millennium, we mean that he will be bound during that era, that his power will be limited after that day commences. 
and not that men will turn to righteousness so that to tie the hands of Satan, thereby bringing millennial conditions to pass. The plan does not call for men to turn voluntarily to righteousness, thereby causing the thousand years of peace to commence. Rather, the millennium will be brought about by power. The wicked will be destroyed, and those only will remain on earth who are sufficiently righteous to abide the day of his coming, a day when the elements shall melt with fervent heat and all things become new. However, Satan shall be bound, and for a thousand years he will have not power to tempt any man. Accordingly, children shall grow up without sin unto salvation, and righteousness and peace will be everywhere present. It was this concept that caused Nephi to write, speaking of the period of the commencement of the millennium, that, quote, because of the righteousness of his people, Satan has no power, wherefore he cannot be loosed for the space of many years, for he hath no power over the hearts of the people, for they dwell in righteousness, and the Holy One of Israel reigneth. 1 Nephi 22:26. Elder Eldridge G. Smith said, Many other scriptures refer to the thousand years of wonderful, glorious conditions on the earth, because Lucifer, Satan, and devil will be bound. The scriptures say he will be bound with a chain and put into a bottomless pit. To me, these are symbolic terms. I cannot quite conceive of still chains or pits that could hold Satan. The only power I know that will bind Satan or render him powerless is righteous living. The war that started in heaven has not ended yet and will not end until everyone has proved the extent of his ability to resist Satan. Even Jesus Christ had to bind Satan when he was tempted in the wilderness. Satan had no power over him because Jesus resisted his temptations. Then the record says he departed from him for a season. When you have resisted a temptation until it no longer becomes a temptation, then to that extent Satan has lost his power over you. And as long as you do not yield to him, to that degree he is bound. End of quote. Revelation 23, 7 through 8, loosed for a little season. The scriptures do not entirely explain why Satan must be loosed for a little season after having been bound for the thousand years following the Lord's second coming. However, the Lord has revealed that after the thousand years have ended, people would again begin to deny their God. The Book of Mormon also describes a time when people again turn their hearts towards Satan after an extended season of peace and righteousness because of the pride that followed prosperity. Whatever the reason that Satan will be loose, John saw that after the millennium, Satan would deceive the nations to gather them together for a final battle against the saints. Verse 20, verse 3, set a seal upon him, meaning other versions of the Bible agree that it was the pit that was sealed rather than the devil himself. To ensure that the devil could no more escape, the pit that is his prison will be sealed shut by the power of God. The phrase that he should deceive the nations no more, meaning we see in Revel in 12.9 that Satan's mission on earth is to deceive the people and the nations of the world. But when he is captured, bound with chains, and cast in the pit, he will no longer be able to deceive the people of the world. The phrase, loose the little season, meaning for Satan shall be bound, and when he is loosed again, he shall only reign for a little season, and then cometh the end of the earth. How long will the little season be? President Joel Fielding Smith suggests it may last a thousand years. His reasoning is that Christ came in the meridian of midday of time, that from the fall of his coming was 4,000 years, that from then until now is another 2,000, that the millennium itself will be 1,000, and that to make the time of his coming the actual meridian of verse temporal continuance needs the added 1,000 years of post-millennial existence. Latter-day Revelation gives additional details about what will transpire during that little season. Satan shall be bound, that old serpent who is called the devil, and shall be loosed for the space of a thousand years. And then he will be loosed for a sea little season, that he may gather together his armies. And Michael, the seventh angel, even the archangel, shall together 
his armies, even the host of heaven, and the devil shall gather together his armies, even the host of hell, and shall come up and battle against Michael and his armies. And then cometh the battle of the great God, the devil and his armies shall be cast away into their own place, that they shall have no power over the saints any more at all. For Michael shall fight their battles, and shall overcome him who seeketh the throne of him, who sitteth upon the throne, even the Lamb. This cannot be a physical battle of physical bodies, because you have Michael and his hosts who are resurrected. So this is most likely that battle against false ideologies, philosophies, ideas, and all of those things that Satan uses to deceive people. Revelation 24, judgment was given unto them. The enthroned being John saw in Revelation 24, who were given power to judge, may represent the twelve apostles Jesus called during his mortal ministry. Jesus said that the apostles would sit on thrones and judge Israel. Under Christ, selected agents and representatives sit in judgment upon specific people and nations. Scriptural intimate Intimations indicate there should be a great judicial hierarchy, each judge acting in his own sphere of appointment and in conformity with the eternal principles of judgment which are in Christ. The great hierarchical chain of judgment with Christ at the head will include Adam and the prophets of all ages, Peter and the apostles of the apostles of all ages and all the elders of the kingdom of all ages who have kept their covenants, died in the faith, and have entitled, therefore, as the Lord says, to receive a crown of righteousness and to be clothed upon, even as I am, to you with me, that we may be one. Though the Lord has indicated that some of his servants will assist him as judges, the scriptures also affirm that Jesus Christ will be the great and final judge of all. The phrase, the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Christ and for the word of God, meaning the martyrs for Christ will reign with Christ. And those who laid down his life in my cause for my name's sake shall find it again, even life eternal. 20 verse 4, they live and reign with Christ a thousand years. We see in Revelation 13, 15, the righteous are slain for refusing to worship the beast or to receive the mark. The beast gained a temporary victory, but here they rise in the resurrection to live forevermore and to reign victorious with their king. During the thousand years of millennial, millennium, Christ will reign personally upon the earth. With him will reign the martyrs and other righteous people who resisted the great pressure to worship the beast who will rise up in the first resurrection. In my own due time will I come upon the earth in judgment. And my people shall be redeemed and shall come with and reign with me on earth. For the great millennium of which I have spoken by the mouth of all my servants shall come. That's Dr. Covenants 43, 29 through 30. Revelation 25 through 6. The first resurrection, the rest of the dead. John saw that many of the dead would be resurrected during what is called the first resurrection. Elder Bruce R. McCarthy explained the first resurrection. To those who lived before the resurrection of Christ, the day of his coming from forth from the dead was known as the first resurrection. Abinadi and Alma, for instance, so considered it. To those who lived since that day, the first resurrection is yet future and will take place at the time of the second coming. We have no knowledge that the resurrection is going on now or that any persons have been resurrected since that day in which Christ came forth excepting Peter, James, and Moroni, all of whom had special labors to perform in this day which necessitated a tangible resurrected body. Those who receive celestial and terrestrial bodies will come forth in the first resurrection. The rest of the dead, who lived not again until the thousand years were finished, are those of the last resurrection, the resurrection of the unjust, which occurs at the end of the millennium. This resurrection will include those who will inherit a telestial glory and those who will remain filthy still, meaning the sons of perdition, and, <clears throat> and those who remain filthy still, meaning the sons of perdition, who inherit no degree of of glory, but go away into the lake of fire and brimstone with the angel and with the devil and his angels. Twenty verse six: Blessed and holy are 
They who have part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. Those who are blessed in the first to rise first are blessed indeed, for, for spirits look upon the long absence of their body spirits from their bodies as a bondage. They are further blessed because they are victorious over the second death, meaning spiritual death. They are made priests of God and of Christ, and they are chosen to reign with him a thousand years. They are holy because they are righteous, and because they are made holy by the glorified bodies they are given in the resurrection. 20 verse 7, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Because Satan will be bound by the power of God as well as by the choices and desires of the people, it is reasonable to suppose that both these elements will be present in his loosening. Satan will likely be loosed because the people turn to him again and because the Lord, suffering their agency, will allow it. As we read in D.N.C. 29:22, when the thousand years are ended and men again begin to deny their God, then will I spare the earth but for a little season. The account in 4 Nephi 1 gives us a sobering preview of how the bright millennial era can be brought to a close. After the Savior's visit to the descendants of Lehi in America, the people entered into a condition that was millennial in some important respects. There was no contention in the land because the love of God which did dwell in the hearts of the people, and there were no envies, no strifes, no tumults, no whoredoms, nor lines, no mortars, nor any matter of lasciviousness. And surely there could not be a happy people among the people who have been created by the hand of God. They were in one, the children of Christ, and heirs to the kingdom of God. And how blessed were they, for the Lord did bless them in all their doings. The breakdown in this near-perfect society had tiny beginnings. A small part of the people revolted from the church and had taken upon them the name of Lamanites. After many years, in this 201st year, there began to be among them those who were lifted up in pride, such as the wearing of costly apparel and all manner of fine pearls and of the fine things of the world. And from t time forth they did have their goods and their substance no more common among them. And they began to be divided into classes, and they began to build up churches again unto themselves to get gain, and began to deny the true church of Christ. 4 Nephi 1, 24-26 from that point, the society disintegrated rapidly within the next decade. There were many churches in the land, yea, there were many churches which professed to know God, and yet they did deny the more parts of his gospel, insomuch that they did receive all manner of wickedness, and did administer that which was sacred unto him who it had been forbidden because of his unworthiness. And this church did multiply exceedingly because of iniquity, and because of the power of Satan, who did get hold upon their hearts. Thus it was that in only a few years Satan, who had essentially been bound, was loose again in the land, and thus they did dwindle in unbelief and wickedness from year to year. And there was a great division among the people, and the more wicked part of the people was strong, and became exceedingly more numerous than were the people of God. By the time three hundred years had passed away, the robbers of Ganeatin did spread over all the face of the land, and there were none that were righteous, save it were the disciples of Jesus. The decline and fall of this blessed society makes for trouble, troubling reading, and the lessons of our day are clear. Satan ever lies in wait to deceive and destroy, and if he fails with one generation, he will try with redoubled efforts to harm the next. We cannot say whether the picture we see in 4th Nephi will be experienced towards in the millennium, but it is certain possible that the pattern will be repeated. Revelation 27 through 10, a final battle. John saw after the millennium Satan would be loosed, and he and his evil forces would again wage war against the camp of the saints and the beloved city, which is Zion, a place of safety and refuge. John referred to Satan's host by the symbolic names Gog and Magog. Ezekiel used these same, same names to refer to foreign invaders who would attack Israel before the Lord's coming. But in Revelation 27-9, Gog and Magog refer to the forces of Satan that wage war 
af an wage another battle at the end of the millennium. Though the number of the Satan's forces will be as the sands of the sea, they will be devoured by fire from God out of heaven, and the devil and his followers will be eternally cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. With this final cleansing of evil, the earth will be prepared to receive celestial glory. Latter-day Revelation adds that detail that Michael, the archangel who was Adam, will play an important role in this final battle by gathering the armies of God together against Satan and his armies. Doctrine and Covenants 88, 110 through 116 states, Satan shall be bound, that old serpent who is called the devil, and shall not be loosed for the space of a thousand years. And then he shall be loosed for a little season. Then he may gathers together his armies. And Michael, the seventh angel, even the archangel, shall gather together his armies, even the hosts of heaven. And the devil shall gather together his army, even the hosts of hell, and shall come to battle against Michael and his armies. And then cometh the battle of the great God, and the devil and his armies shall be cast away unto their own place, and they shall have no power over the saints any more at all. For Michael shall fight their battle, battles, and he shall overcome him who seeketh the throne of him who sitteth upon the throne, even the Lamb. This is the glory of God and the sanctified, and they shall not any more see death. Revelation 20.10. What is the lake of fire and brimstone? The Old Testament describes the destruction of the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by fire and brimstone from heaven. In the book of Revelation, fire and brimstone symbolize the destruction and the ultimate abode of the wicked. As a boy K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, quote, The prophets speak of the gall of bitterness and often compare the pain of guilt to fire and brimstone. Brimstone is another name for sulfur. That lake of fire and brimstone ever burning but never consumed is a description in the scriptures for hell. The pain of their guilt forever. God, how could that be worth any of the wickedness in this earth is beyond me. A prophet Joseph Smith taught, a man is his own tormentor and his own condemner. Hence the saying, they shall go into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The torment of disappointment in the mind of man is as exquisite as the lake burning with fire and brimstone. Revelation 20.11 A great white throne, emblematic of purity and justice. Phrase him that sat on it, Christ our Lord, the great eternal judge. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. The phrase, the earth and the heaven fled away. This is truly the end of the earth and of the atmospheric heaven which surrounds it. This is day when there shall be a new earth, a celestial sphere. For all old things shall pass away and all things shall become new, even the heaven and the earth. And all the fullness thereof, both men and beasts, the fowls of the air, the fishes of the sea, and not one hair, neither moat shall be lost. For all is the workmanship of mine hand. Revelation twenty twelve through 15 Judged according to their works. The final judgment is part of God's plan of salvation. John saw the day when all of God's children would stand before Christ to be judged out of those things which were written in the books. The phrase, the dead, small, and great stand before God, meaning essentially this is the judgment of the wicked dead. True, all men, both the righteous and the wicked, shall be present. All shall hear the decrees. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul says. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so shall every one that shall give an account of himself to God. This is the day of which Jacob wrote, and it shall come to pass that all men shall have passed from it this first death unto life, insomuch they have become immortal. They may appear before the judgment seat of the Holy One of Israel, and then cometh the judgment, and then must they be judged according to the holy judgments of God. 2 Nephi 9.15 But at this late date, the judgment of the righteous dead is in fact a thing of the past. It long antedates this formal occasion when all men shall stand before the judgment bar to hear confirmed what has already been established. 
Thus, when the great God sits upon the white throne, the righteous have been judged, having received eternal life, having entered into glorious rest, having lived and reigned during the millennium, and having been judged by those appointed so to do all these things shall now stand before the bar of great Jehovah to have judgment confirmed. But the wicked and the godly shall then be judged according to the deeds done in the flesh. They shall be judged not by the Lord's agents, not for instance by the twelve who shall judge the faithful in the house of Israel and none else but by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is who shall assign them their place in the lesser mansions that are prepared. In the first resurrection there are many judges, in the second one alone, him to whom Father hath committed all judgments. The phrase and the books were opened. These books include one, the book of life, two, church records that record the saving ordinances and perhaps other actions of faith and devotion, three, the scriptures which contain the standards and commandments by which we were to live our lives and by which we will be judged. In addition to these books, the books might also refer to other sources of light and knowledge that were available to people during their lives. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, quote, God judges men according to the use they make of the light which he gives them, unquote. He also explained, quote, the Lord will award judgment or mercy to all nations according to their several deserts, their means of obtaining intelligence, the laws by which they are governed, the facilities afforded them of obtaining correct information and his inscrutable designs. End of quote. Revelation 20.13, there should be an end to death and an end to hell. Jesus Christ hath abolished death. He gained the victory over the grave, and every living soul shall come forth in the resurrection. And then the wicked and ungodly shall come forth out of hell to be judged according to the works and receive their inheritance in the telestial kingdom. Hell itself ends. <clears throat> it no longer exists. All of its captive spirits are freed from their prison. Thus Jacob says, Oh, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth a way for the escape from the grasp of this awful monster, yea, the monster of death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also the death of the spirit. And because of the way of deliverance of our God, the Holy One of Israel, this death of which I have spoken, which is temporal, shall deliver up its dead, which is death, is the grave. And this death of which I have spoken, which is spiritual, shall deliver up its dead, which spiritual death is hell. Wherefore, death and hell must deliver up their dead, and hell must deliver up its captive spirits, and the grave must deliver up its captive bodies. And the bodies and the spirits of men will be restored one to another, and it by the power of the resurrection of the Holy One of Israel. Revelation 20.14 after death and hell have delivered up the bodies and the captive spirits which were in them, then, as John foresaw, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This lake of fire, a figure symbolic of eternal anguish and woe, is also called hell, but it is a hell reserved exclusively for the devil and his angels, which include the sons of perdition. Thus, for those who are heirs of some salvation, which include all except the sons of perdition, hell has an end. But for those who have wholly given themselves over to satanic purposes, there is no redemption from the consuming fires of torment of conscience. They go on forever in the hell that is prepared for them. Now to Revelation chapter 21. De while death and hell are... With death and hell abolished, along with Satan and his followers, the earth is ready to be transformed. All the people of the world are ready to dwell on a new creation, having put off the old man and putting on the new man, after the image of him that created him, which is Jesus Christ, and having come forth from the grave in celestial glory, with evil gone and the inhabitants of the earth glorified, the earth itself is changed to inhabit a great glory." The new earth is so much more than simply a globe made new. It is also a new society, a new way of living. It is a place where God may dwell. It is a state of being in which there is no death, no sorrow, or pain. It is a habitation for the heirs of God. 
Revelation 21, 1, a new heaven and a new earth. A part of the fall of Adam, the earth fell from a terrestrial paradisiacal state to a telestial state. When Christ returns and wickedness is destroyed, Christ will reign personally upon the earth and the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisiacal glory. After the thousand years of Christ's earth reign, the earth will be transformed yet again. The prophet Joseph Smith described this chain, quote, The earth will be rolled back into the presence of God and crowned with celestial glory, end of quote. The phrase, there was no more sea, meaning sea shall no longer separate islands and continents as at present. All the land surface of the earth shall be united in one body like it was in the days before it was divided. Revelation 21.2, the holy city, New Jerusalem. In the last days, a remnant of the house of Joseph shall, build up, shall be built up on this land. And they shall build a holy city unto the Lord, like unto the Jerusalem of old. And there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, and there shall be like unto the old, save the old shall have passed away, and all things have become new. And then cometh the new Jerusalem, and blessed are they who dwell therein, for it is they whose garments are white through the blood of the Lamb. 21.3. A great voice out of heaven. The revelation does not explain whose voice it is, whether it is God or an angel. Its function is to explain the meaning of what John is now seeing. The phrase, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he dwelleth with them. Meaning, in the time of Moses, God dwelt among them in the great tent they provided for him, his tabernacle. In the celestialized earth, God will personally come down to earth and stay with his people. After the earth hath filled the measure of its creation, it shall be crowned with glory, even with the presence of God the Father. The phrase, they shall be his people, and God himself shall be their God, meaning the Lord is able to dwell with the people of the celestial earth because they are his people. They have become one with him and are worthy of his presence. This passage fulfills a promise made repeatedly through the Lord's prophets. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. 21, 5 through 4, no more tears, death, or sorrow. Revelation 21, 4 highlights the great restorative power of Christ's atonement, which will ultimately make all things right. The phrase, there shall be no more death, sorrow, crying, or pain, meaning this promised reward is the reverse of the fate of Babylon. There, all sounds of joy have ceased forever. In the celestial Zion, the heavenly new Jerusalem, all sorrow, all sorrow has ceased forever. Death, sickness, and physical pain are no more. And the sources of sorrow and immortal pain include crime, poverty, contention in the home, jealousy, Marital unfaithfulness and a host of others likewise have totally ceased. The phrase, for former things are now past, meaning the former things are those belonging to the old heaven and earth. The old heaven and earth with death, sorrow, and pain and suffering that were integral parts of them are gone forever. Though the atonement, through the atonement of all, life's disadvantages, contradictions, injustices, and unfairnesses will be made right. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles affirmed, The atonement will not only help us overcome our transgression and mistakes, but in his time it will resolve all inequities of life. Those things that are unfair, which are the consequences of circumstances or other acts, and not our own decisions. Boy, how great that will be. 21.5, when this earth becomes a celestial sphere, that city, the new Jerusalem, shall again descend out of heaven from God as this earth becomes the abode of celestial beings forever. Ministering among the Nephites, the resurrected Lord told them that America continent was to be the site of the city to build up latter-day Israel called New Jerusalem. Ether told the Jaredites that this continent was the place of the new Jerusalem which should come down out of heaven. For more details on the city of New Jerusalem we built upon the American continent before the coming of the Savior, see Ether 13, 8-11, Isaiah 65, 17-19, and Moses 7, 62-64. 21.6, it is done. 
Because Christ is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, he is fully able to see the end from the beginning. That which he has ordained to come to pass is though it had already happened. Thus, to God, blessings promised in the future are as certain of fulfillment as if they had already been received. The phrase, I will give unto him, that is Antichrist of the foundation. I'm sorry, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the foundation of water of life freely. Meaning water is an essential source of life. Christ, Jesus Christ is the source of eternal life. As such, he is the fountain of water of life, which water of life is the principle and ordinances of the gospel. As the Lord promised through John, this water is offered freely to all who recognize their spiritual thirst and come unto Christ to be satisfied. Living water may also represent the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, as John recorded elsewhere, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake, he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. 27, 7, he that overcometh. Revelation 27, 7 echoes the promise found in Revelations 2 through 3 to those who overcome. In Revelation 21, 7, the promise of inheriting all things does not mean those who are exalted will no longer worship God. The relationship of God to each of his exalted children is still clear. I will be his God and they shall be my son. The phrase, he that overcometh all, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, meaning when we overcome the temptations of the adversary and rise above the trials of life, then we endure to the end in righteousness. We receive the great blessing of becoming heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Then the king sh shall say to us, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared before you from the foundation of the world, and all that my father shall be given unto him. Then they are gods, even the sons of God. Wherefore all things are theirs, whether life or death, or things present or things to come, all are theirs, and they are Christ, and Christ is God's, and they shall overcome all things. Certainly, overcoming all things requires suffering, sacrifice and suffering. But as Paul taught, I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. In other words, on it, all that we suffer and sacrifice down here will not even come close comparing to the glory that we will receive. This promise follows on others. Sim similar promises made to those who overcome that they will become pillars in the temple of God to go no more out, that the very name of God and Christ's new name will be written upon them, that they will be privileged to sit with Christ on his throne. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. This marvelous promise is given to all who enter the celestial kingdom. Earlier the Lord said, They shall be his people, and God himself shall be their God. But here the Lord makes it personal and individual. I, we will become his sons and his daughters, not just part of a collective group. This assurance is a fulfillment of what Paul promised. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And again, for as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In another setting, John the Revelator gave the same testimony. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth, not, uh, knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The underlying feeling conveyed by this phrase is that the Lord is assuring us of relationship, a close relationship between us and him. He will claim us as his own, draw us to him, hold us close, and treat us tenderly. We will in very deed be his sons and his daughters. Boy, these blessings are worth anything we have to go through down here in this life, brothers and sisters. Why would you give up this life for anything that's worldly? It's beyond me. 
21a, be the, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable murderers and whoremongers, sorcerers and adulterers, and all liars. It is interesting and important that the Lord begins this list of those to be condemned with the fearful and unbelieving. Certainly to have fear and lack of belief are not as serious as the sins that follow in the list. Yet it is the fearful and unbelieving who yield to the enticings of the beast, who fail to stand firm and true in the face of great persecutions and temptations that come upon the faithful. Perhaps fear and unbelief lead to the other sins the Lord lists. All of these are in stark, stark opposition to the character of Christ, who is faithful and true. They have been led astray by the devil, which deceiveth the whole world. They follow their follow Satan, as Christ said, Ye are your father, the devil. There is no truth in him. He is a liar, he, he is a liar, a liar and the father of it. This verse, verse 8, might seem both as a warning and an invitation. A warning to those who do not repent of ungodliness will not be able to enjoy the sweet experience of a new paradisiacal earth and an invitation to turn from such wickedness. The phrase, the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, this expression is a metaphor for the second death. Latter-day scholar Richard Draper has written, Such sinners are Lucifer's, but only for a time. While they are under his power, his full wrath will be spent upon them. For a thousand years, knowing them, their tears, their torments, their misery will be his wine and their scorched souls and burning consciences the butter of his bread. 21.9, one of the seven angels which had the seven last plagues. This is one of the angels that poured the plagues from the seven bowls or vials. The phrase, come hither, I will show thee the bride of the lamb, lamb's wife. The angel's invitation parallels a similar invitation in 17.1, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sit upon the many waters. In the former instance, as in this, John saw a city, the wicked city of the whore, however, is destined to receive eternal destruction, while the new holy city, while the holy new city, New Jerusalem, will be filled forever with the glory of God. 21, 10 to 27, the holy Jerusalem descends out of heaven. This new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, and the holy sanctuary of the Lord, Moroni, wrote, Thus the new Jerusalem built upon the earth by the saints of God will be joined by the new Jerusalem from heaven, which includes the original Zion, Enoch city, the city of holiness, which was taken into heaven. John saw in vision the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down to earth, symbolizing God's presence among his people. The city was depicted as an enormous cube, which recalls the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple, also representative of God's dwelling place. The symbolic element John saw that composes the city, clear glass, precious stones, pearls, and gold, share the traits of reflecting light, resisting decaying or tarnishing, and symbolizing purity, beauty, and refinement. The walls of the city were made with all manners of precious stones. Precious stones are often representative of the Lord's followers who have been refined and made holy. The gates of the city were made of pearls and the streets of gold. Both pearls and gold can be seen as symbols of refinement. Oysters produce pearls through pain and adversity, and gold requires fire to burn out impurities. The phrase, the exalted, will likewise have been refined through adversity, meaning there is no need of temples in the whole holy city, because all of the celestial kingdom will be as a temple. God himself and Jesus Christ dwell there. There is no need of the sun there, for the Lamb of Christ is the light thereof. John saw a central feature of the city, holy city was the tree of life, representative of the healing and eternal life found in the celestial kingdom. The tree of life in the Garden of Eden was guarded by cherubims after the fall, but those who dwell in the holy city have been redeemed from the fall, and all there are free to partake of the ever-bearing tree of life in the celestial kingdom. 21.11, Having the Glory of God this earth is now in its fallen or telestial state, in which condition wickedness prevails on its surface. 
when our Lord comes to usher in the millennial era, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. The earth will be renewed and receive its paradisiacal glory. It will return to its Edenic state, which prevailed before the fall. The wicked, meaning those who live a telestial law, shall either be destroyed before the second coming or be burned at the time. None will remain who do not live at least a terrestrial law. Then at the end of the millennium, plus the appointed little season, this planet will change again. Once more, there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, but this time our globe will become a celestial sphere, and none shall remain on its surface unless they live a celestial law. In that day, the poor, the meek, and the earth shall inherit it, meaning that the God-fearing and the righteous, those who have lived a celestial law, the law of the gospel, willingly of their own accord, shall be the sole inhabitants of this planet. To prepare the earth itself for this glorious day, the Lord says our planet, of the very elements which it has composed it, therefore it must needs be sanctified from all unrighteousness, that it may be prepared for the celestial glory. For after it hath filled the measure of its creation, it shall be crowned with glory, even with the presence of God the Father. The bodies who are of the celestial kingdom may possess it forever and ever. For for this intent was it made and created. For this intent are the sanctified. And again, verily I say unto you, the earth abideth the law of the celestial kingdom, for it fulfilleth the measure of its creation, and transgresseth no law. Wherefore it will be sanctified, yea, notwithstanding it shall die, it shall be quickened again, and it shall abide the power by which it is quickened, and the righteous shall inherit it. 21.11 her light was like a most precious. Uh, her light was like a stone, most precious, clear as crystal. Descriptive of conditions in the holy Jerusalem, which is now in heaven, where God is. Our revelation recites: the angels do not reside on a planet like this earth, but they reside in the presence of God on a globe like a sea of glass and fire, where all things for their glory are manifest, present, past, present, and future and are continually before the Lord. The place where God resides is a great Urim and Thummim. Then as the conditions on this planet, as they shall be after the holy city descends out of heaven from God, the record continues, this earth in its sanctified and immortal state will be made like unto crystal and will be a, a Urim and Thummim to the inhabitants who dwell thereon, whereby all things pertaining to an inferior kingdom or all kingdoms of lower order will be manifest to those who dwell on it, and this earth will be Christ. Stock and Covenants 130, verses 6 through 9. 12, 21, 12, a, great, a wall great and high. This expression suggests that people inside the city will enjoy absolute peace and complete security, and that none can enter except by the gate, 12 gates. Though the city is surrounded by an impregnable wall, those who qualify may freely enter. That they are twelve gates indicates a ready entrance for the faithful. The twelve gates may represent the twelve tribes of Israel or the twelve apostles who will judge the worthiness of the people to enter the holy city. The phrase at the gates, twelve angels. The angels may well be guardians or sentinels assigned to prevent entrance in the city by any therein that defileth. It may be that these angels represent the angels Brigham Young described when he defined the temple endowment, quote, Your endowment is to receive all those ordinances in the house of the Lord which are necessary for you after you have departed this life to enable you to walk back into the presence of the Father, passing the angels who stand as sentinels, being able to give them the key words, the signs and tokens pertaining to the holy priesthood and gain your eternal exaltation in spite of heaven, earth and hell. End of quote. The frame names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of Is children of Israel. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes, probably with a different gate assigned to each tribe. To enter the celestial city of Zion, one must enter as member of the family of Ab Abraham, according to the Abrahamic covenant. That may be the purpose of the symbolism here, that we enter Zion through the gate of or by membership in one of the twelve tribes of Israel. 
21.14, the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, signifying that their names, as well as those of all who endure valiantly in the cause of truth and righteousness, shall be had in honorable and everlasting remembrance in the presence of God and his saints. 21.15, he that talked with me had a golden reed. This golden reed is a measuring rod. Perhaps only a measuring rod made of gold is appropriate to be used with the holy city of gold. To measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof, the angel has apparently been commissioned to measure the heavenly city and convey the information to John and thus to us. 21.16, the city lieth four square, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. After the angel measures the city, John learns that it is shaped like an enormous cube like the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple. The Holy of Holies was the holiest place on earth, the innermost chamber of the temple, the earthly place where God would visit. The city in John's vision was likewise the holiest place on the new earth, and likewise was the dwelling place of God. Both were formed in the shape of a cube, a symbol of perfection. Now the Bruce Amakonki states, Here is a city in size and dimensions and splendor and glory which is far beyond human experience or comprehension, that there is no way to convey to the finite mind what the eternal reality is. Hence expressions relative to precious stones, to streets of gold, and to pearly gates. It is noteworthy that the city is cubic in shape, calculated on the basis of 606 feet 9 inches to the furlong. Its outer limits will stretch nearly 1,400 miles in length and breadth and height. This means that there will be approaching 2 trillion 7 144 million cubic miles of dwelling space within its sacred portals. 2117, and he measured the walls thereof in 144 cubits according to the measure of the angel. The repetition of the number 12 in the stones in the gate stands as a constant reminder of the priestly power that guards and envelops all aspects and operations of the holy city. This is seen especially in the measurement of the walls. John notes that they are 144 cubits after the measure of an angel. The size of an angelic cubic is unknown. What is important is the number 12 squared, signifying the fullness of the priesthood authority. This is what surrounds and stands as a bulwark to the city. 2118, this build, this wall of the the building of the wall of it was of jasper. We see in 2111 that the city is like jasper, of God himself is like jasper. Here the wall of the city is jasper. The symbolism seems to be that the very walls of the city give glorious testimony to the presence of God. The city was pure gold likened to clear glass. In Revelation 4, 6, John sees that God's throne is a city of glass likened to crystal. In Revelation 21, 11, the city is likened to clear glass crystal. In the Doctrine and Covenants, the earth itself is likened to crystal, and the globe where God and his angels dwell is like a sea of glass and fire. In Revelation 21, 21, the streets are pure gold as if as it were transparent glass. These images of pure gold, transparent glass, and perfect crystal suggest perfection and clarity. They suggest great worth, value, and preciousness. They suggest materials that reflect and magnify the brilliance of light. Perhaps these things will work together with the Urim and Thummim, that is, the earth itself, to create an environment in which great truths are more readily made manifest to the inhabitants of the earth. 21, 19 through 20, the foundation of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. Isaiah used a similar description of the heavenly city to indicate the love and attractiveness of God. Quoting Isaiah, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundation with sapphires, and I will make thy windows of agates, and thy gates of carbuncles, 
and all thy borders of pleasant stones, and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great will be the peace of thy children, and righteousness shalt thou be established, and thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. That's Isaiah 54, 11 through 14. The stones listed in these very verses may be compared with those on the breastplate of the high priest anciently, each of which bore the name of one of the twelve tribes. In the New Jerusalem, however, these stones are linked to the twelve apostles rather than to the twelve tribes of Israel. These stones may also be contrasted with the precious stones worn by the harlot, who is the symbol of another city. 2121, the twelve gates for twelve pearls. Pearls were viewed as very precious in New Testament times. Pearls are not mentioned in the Old Testament, but the Lord revealed through Isaiah concerning the same city, I will make thy gates of carbuncles. Like pearls, carbuncles were valued as precious stones. The truth common to both passages is that the gates were made of priceless materials, indicating the great value the people and the Lord placed on the holy city itself. Every silver gate was of one pearl meaning the pearls used in the construction of the gate were so remarkable that one marvelous pearl was all that was needed to make each gate. This detail seems to emphasize again the magnificence and different elements of the city. 21-22, no temple therein. There are at least two possible reasons why no temple is needed in the celestial city. First, the entire city is the house of the Lord. The Lord is ever present there. Second, all the inhabitants have made the necessary covenants. All the ordinance work for the living and the dead have been completed. All are fully qualified for a celestial life. Nothing more remains to be done. Of course, in another sense, there is a temple in heaven, as John saw repeatedly in vision. But a deeper truth is that all of heaven is the temple, as we can deduce from the description of the heavenly city in this chapter of Revelation. And a truth deeper still is that God himself is the temple. What John may mean then is that there may be no single structure called a temple in heaven. Everything about the heavenly experience partakes of the spirit and beauty and light of the temple. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it, meaning we go to the temple in mortality, receive ordinances, make covenants, and draw closer to the Lord. In a celestial world, we will actually live in God's presence. Perhaps rather than go to a sacred edifice to draw us near to the Lord, we will seek to go to Him directly. Rather than go to a sacred edifice to make covenants and agreements with God, we will most likely go to Him directly. In the celestial kingdom, the temple ceases to be a means to come to God. We will go to Him directly. 21-23, the city had no... Neither the sun, neither the moon, to shine on it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. When God, with his brightness, is present, we do not need the secondary light source of the sun and the moon. After all, the sun and the moon have power to shine in the first place because of the light of Christ. 21-24, the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it meaning the Father and the Son give their light to the heavenly city, and the city gives its light to the nations of the saved on the earth. In turn, the kings of the earth will bring in their treasures, or the kings of the earth shall bring in all their splendor. But what are these nations of the celestial world, and who are the kings? The kings of the earth were destroyed in 1919 and 21 and 20, verse 9. John testified at the beginning of the book that Christ hath made us kings and priests unto God. Here he shows us that the Lord and triumph will indeed bring us forth in glory as kings or queens and priestesses, as the case may be. These kings who will be us and our fellows as exalted glorified souls will bring the riches of their inheritance as well as the glory of their own being into the city. 21, 25, the gates of it shall not be shut all by day. This expression indicates the degree of security and peace in the land. For there shall be no night there, because God is the light of the city, and because he is ever-present. This light shines constantly. There will never be neither day 
nor night there, but one constant, ever, never ceasing period of light. 21.27, there shall in no wise enter to it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever maketh abomination or maketh a lie. The Lord apparently wants to... The Lord apparently wants to underscore this truth. No unclean thing can enter his kingdom. But they which are written in the books, Lamb's Book of Life, those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, specifically all those who worship the beast, have been prohibited from entering the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Our last chapter, chapter 22, verse 1. He shewed me a pure river of water. In the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, is a river of water of life, which flows from the throne of God. Besides the river are two trees of life. These features are reminiscent of the Garden of Eden, as we read in Genesis. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. There is a river, the psalmist wrote, the streams thereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place, the tabernacle, <coughs> excuse me, of the Most High. Psalms 46, 4. In Lehi's, Lehi's great vision, he also saw the tree of life, and near the tree was a river of water. When Nephi learned the interpretation, he discovered that the tree represented the love of God, which shed itself abroad in the hearts of the children of men. Wherefore, it is most desirable above all things. He also learned that the rod of iron which my father had seen was the word of God, which led to the fountain of living water, or to the tree of life, which waters are a representation of the love of God. And I also beheld that the tree of life was a representation of the love of God. Thus, the tree of life and the pure river of water of life both represent the same thing, the love of God. Could it be that the pure love of God, given as a gift from him to us, and then returned with full hearts back to him and to others, is what brings us to eternal life, and thus sustains and empowers us there? Proceeding out of the throne of God as a lamb, meaning Ezekiel saw waters flowing from beneath the temple or the house of God. Here they flow from the throne, which might represent the Holy of Holies in the heavenly temple. The waters of life then, or the waters of love, come forth from God's throne, from the heart of the God's holy city. The symbolism suggests that these waters come directly from God himself. The love of God is a motivating power unto eternal life. As John declared elsewhere, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Earlier in John's vision, he sees the throne of God in heaven, but now it has come down to earth in the new Jerusalem. For God will dwell with his people. It is noteworthy that God the Father and Jesus the Son seem here to share one throne, which may be represented of the perfection of their union. That union was expressed in Jesus' great intercessory prayer. 22.2, in the midst of the street of it, and on the other side of the river, this sentence is made clear by other translation. In its context we read, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life flowing down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding each fruit every month. Phrase the tree of life. The tree of life here lies in the midst of the street. Perhaps that street represents the straight and narrow path that Lehi saw which leads through the trials and temptations of mortality upward to the tree and ultimately to the celestial city of God. We know that in the Garden of Eden was a real tree called the Tree of Life, and in that setting, as well as elsewhere in Scripture, the Tree of Life also functions as a symbol for eternal life. The Tree of Life in the celestial city has no cherubim guarding it, as did the tree in the Garden of Eden, for all in the city have a right to freely partake. And there is no mention of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The inhabitants of the city, having successfully passed through mortality, have experienced both good and evil, and they have rejected all evil and turned wholly to the good. They are now entitled to eternal life, which the fruit of the tree symbolizes. 
There is also possibly a deeper level of meaning here. Trees often, often symbolize, symbolically stand for people, and the tree of life symbolizes that perfect man who brings us life. It may be that the tree of life in the celestial city include the exalted souls who have come into Christ and become like him, souls who have gained eternal life. The phrase which bear twelve manners of fruit and yell the fruit every month. This passage suggests that each tree bears a different fruit every month for a total of twelve varieties each year. Further, unlike most fruit trees which bear fruit their fruit seasonally, the fruit of the tree of life is ever available. The tree of life is always living and growing, never subject to death, not even subject to the normal consequences of winter's death, a spring sprouting, a summer's growth, an autumn's harvest, and another winter's death. Lehi described the tree of life, the fruit of the tree of life, as desirable to make one happy and desirable above all fruit. He said it filled my soul with exceedingly great joy. Alan described this fruit as most precious, which is sweet above all that is sweet. And ye shall feast upon this fruit even until ye are filled, that ye hunger not, neither shall ye thirst. If the tree of life, if the trees of life are the exalted souls and the celestial glory, the fruit of the tree may be their goodness and their good works that bless others forever. The leaves of the trees for the healing of the for the healing of the nations, meaning because the tree symbolizes the love of God, it is only consistent to understand that the leaves of the trees would help to bring peace, union, and spiritual strength, in a word, healing, to the nations of the world. This use is probably symbolic, though there may actually be plants in the worlds of glory that bring blessings to those who gain the right to use them. The nations mentioned here may be those in 21, 24 through 26, which have been saved by the power of Christ. As he said to us all, by way of invitation, will ye not now return unto me and repent of your sins and be converted, lest I may heal you? Or as Elder Orson Pratt wrote, quote, when John sees it, the tree of life, the nations have no need of healing, for there is no death, neither pain nor sorrow. For the former things have passed away, and all things have become new. Consequently, he speaks in the past tense and says they were for the healing of the nations, of course, referring to the times when they existed temporally, according to Ezekiel, before their final change. End of quote. Uh, 23, verse 3, there shall, no, there shall be no more curse. This passage seems to refer to the curse that was found, that was pronounced on Adam and Eve at the time of the fall, that they would surely die, but partaking of the forbidden fruit that the woman would bear children in sorrow, and that men would eat bread in the sweat of his face, the ground itself in fact was cursed for the sake and in sorrow for thy sake, and in sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Those in the celestial world would be subject to the curses no more. It is interesting to note that the Bible begins with the record of humankind being cursed and ends with a vision of those curses being removed. The phrase, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, meaning the but that joins this phrase with the preceding phrase suggests that the presence of God in the Lamb is an essential reason why a curse could not exist in New Jerusalem. The presence of God blesses all that receive it. In particular, the curse of spiritual death is removed by the presence of of God. 22.4. His name shall be in their foreheads. As an earlier passage in Revelation, to bear a name on one's forehead indicates allegiance. Bearing the name also suggests taking on the character of the one named. Bearing God's name on one's forehead may also be connected to image of priesthood and temple service. Elder David A. Bednar, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained how receiving this blessing is associated with temple worship. Quote, in the dedicatory prayer, the curtain and temple, the prophet Joseph Smith petitioned the Father, Thy servants may go forth from this house, armed with thy power, and that thy name may be upon them. He also asked for a blessing over the people upon whom thy name should be put in this house. And as the Lord appeared in and accepted the curtain and temple as his house, he declared, For behold, I have accepted this house, and my name shall be here, and I will manifest myself to my people in mercy, in this house. 
These scriptures help us understand that the process of taking upon ourselves the name of Christ that is commenced in the waters of baptism is continued and enlarged in the house of the Lord. In the ordinances of the holy temple, we more completely and fully take upon us the name of Christ. End of quote. 22.5 There shall be no night there, no need candle, no light of sun. A light emanates from the person of God, as Joseph Smith saw in the sacred goat grove. <clears throat> I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun. I saw two persons whose brightness and glory defy all description. God, with the great light of his being, will dwell in the celestial city, and thus there will never be night, nor need for artificial light of candle, nor need for the sun. The phrase, they shall reign forever and ever, meaning, when we ascend to our glory as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, we will reign with them forever. As sons of God, we shall be like him. We ourselves shall be gods. We will truly be like our Father, our Lord. Every man who reigns in celestial glory is a god to his dominions. The righteous are the rulers of heaven. 22.6 These sayings are faithful and true. When the Lord's agents speak by the power of the Holy Spirit, and angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ, they can and do bear that perfect testimony which includes the solemn proclamation that the doctrines they have taught and the words they have spoken are true. 22.7 I come quickly, although Bruce R. McConkey helps us understand what it means that the Lord comes quickly. Not soon, but in a quick manner, that is, with speed and suddenness, after all the promised conditions, precedents have occurred. 22, 8-9, I am thy fellow servant. After all that John had seen and heard in his vision, he fell down to worship at the feet of an angel, but the angel replied, replied See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. From modern scripture we learn about the angels who ministered to the inhabitants of the earth. There are no angels who minister to this earth, but those who belong or have belonged to it. Hence, when men, messengers are sent to minister to the inhabitants of the earth, they are not strangers, but they are from the ranks of our kindreds, friends, and fellow servants. 22.10. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Daniel was given a vision and told to seal it up to the time of the end. It was not the Lord's purpose for the world to know the things Daniel received. Earlier in John's vision, he is told to seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Perhaps the time has not yet come for these specific things to be revealed, but the rest of the prophecy was intended for the world and the saints, and John was commanded not to seal it up, but to let it go forth for others to read and to seek to understanding. 22 verse 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. What is true of a person's spirit as it moves from this life to the next is also true of the person as he or she faces the time of the second coming of Christ. If we procrastinate the day of our repentance until the Lord's coming, we will continue in our filthiness after he arrives. And likewise, the righteous and holy will continue in their holiness. Jacob taught the same principle using the same words in the reference to our state at the final judgment. They who are righteous shall be righteous still, and they who are filthy shall be filthy still. 22.13 I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. These are the words of the angel speaking on behalf of Christ. 21.14 Blessed are they that do his commandments. This passage is another of the Beatitudes found in Revelation. Those who do as the Lord commands them to do are blessed indeed. As the verse explains, they are privileged to partake of the fruit of the tree of life, to enter into the heavenly city. In other words, those who obey the Lord's commands are blessed with the celestial glory and have a right to the tree of life. 22.15 For without are dogs. Dogs is a traditional Jewish designation for heathen Gentiles. The dogs or the unbelievers must stay outside without the city. They are not blessed with celestial glory. 
the phrase sorcerers, warmongers, murderers, idolaters, and whoever loveth and maketh a lie, meaning in 21.8, we learn that the sinners in this list will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone and will suffer the second death. Here we see that such sinners will also be barred from entering into the city, so the celestial city of New Jerusalem. This list echoes that of the earlier one, but whosoever loveth and maketh a lie is much more emphatic and descriptive than all liars. These people will not only be outside without the city, but outside the entire kingdom, having been assigned to a lesser kingdom called Telestial. 22.16, the root and the offspring of David. The son of David was also David's Lord. Christ established David, was the source of his power, and through David's lineage, the great God receives his mortal body. The bright morning star. Christ is the bright morning star. And speaking of a man as a star, the meaning is that he is a person of brilliant qualities who stands out preeminently among his fellows. Thus, to single out our Lord as the bright morning star, the last bright luminary of the night to give way before the rising sun, is to testify that he is preeminent over all his brethren, that he is the Son of God in whom all fullness and perfection dwells. 27.17, the Spirit and the Bride. The Spirit is the Holy Ghost which speaks to the prophets and righteous members alike. The Bride is the New Jerusalem, or in a broader sense, the righteous members of the church. Meaning, this word seems to be an invitation to Christ to return in triumph to glory to the earth. Those making the invitation include the Holy Spirit, the Bride of Christ, the Church, and all those who hear the words of John's vision. The phrase, Him that heareth. Here John speaks of all those who hear or read the words of this book, but he speaks specifically to those who truly hear with their hearts, not with their ears alone. John invites them to join the Spirit and the Bride in seeking the coming of Christ. The phrase, let him that is a thirst come, meaning, as John invites those who hear his words to seek the coming of second coming of Christ, he also invites those who are spiritually thirsty to come as well, to pray, take freely of the water of life, that they may be ready to welcome their Savior and rejoice with all those who have received admittance in the celestial city. The living water of which we partake, of course, is Christ himself who gives us spiritual life with love, his truth, and his atoning power. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh unto me shall never thirst, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. If any man thirst, <clears throat> he said, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. The phrase, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely, meaning this water is offered freely to only those who recognize their spiritual thirst and come unto Christ to be satisfied. 22.18-19 Any man add unto these things. The passage, if any man shall add unto these things, has been often misunderstood as the declaration that no scripture was to come forth after the writing of the book of Revelation. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles clarified this statement, refer, clarifies that this statement refers only to the book of Revelation, not to the book, not to the Bible as a whole. Quote, one of the arguments often used in any defense of a close canon is in the New Testament passage recorded in Revelation 22.18. For I testify even unto man that heareth the words of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. However, there is now overwhelming consensus among virtually all biblical scholars that this verse applies only to the book of Revelation, not the whole Bible. Though scholars of our day acknowledge a number of New Testament books that were almost certainly written after John's revelation on the Isle of Patmos was received. Included in this category are at least the books of Jude, the three epistles of John, and probably the entire Gospel of John itself. Perhaps there are even more than these. 
But there is even, but there is a simpler answer as to why that passage in the final book of the current New Testament cannot apply to the whole Bible. That is because the whole Bible, as we know it, one collection of texts bound in a single volume, did not exist when that verse was written. For centuries after John produced his writing, the individual books in the New Testament were in circulation singularly or perhaps in combinations with a few or other texts, but almost never as a complete collection. Of the entire corpus of 5,366 known Greek New Testament manuscripts, only 35 contain the whole New Testament as we know it, and of 34 of those were compiled after A.D. 1000. So, this warning can only refer to the book of Revelation. And no one, the Book of Mormon, member Nephi, no one added to the book of Revelation and the vision that was seen therein. Nephi saw it, but he was told not to write it, that John would write it. So this does not mean that there would be no more scripture after this. It just means that no one was going to add to the book of Revelation. 2220. 20, he which testified these things. He is Jesus Christ as seen by the first person reference in the next phrase. However, it is very well could be John's angelic visitor speaking in the name of Christ. The verse, even so, come Lord Jesus. Meaning, John joins his voice to those of the Spirit, the Bride, and those who read and believe John's revelation, asking the Lord to come quickly as he promised. 20, 20, 2221, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. This is a benedictory statement from John to his readers, a blessing offered on their heads. It matches like a book in the introduction John made at the very beginning of the book. This benediction was common in the New Testament writings. Every one of Paul's epistles end with this kind of statement. All but two, Romans and 1 Corinthians, have it in the last verse. And sometimes the language is identical. The statement underscores an important truth that John and Paul both desire to teach that it is the grace or gift of Christ when coupled with our faith, repentance, obedience that enables us to live and do and reach and grow and in the end to be exalted. The grace of Christ is indeed offered to all. Therefore, let him that is a thirst come. Whoever, whoever will, let him take of the waters of life freely. Boy, brothers and sisters, may we partake of the water freely, that we can have these great blessings that John describes that will only come to those in exaltation in the celestial kingdom. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.